Okay, let's start our event. Uh, thank you all participants to uh, join our event today. Uh, today we want to talk about how we can create bridges between different regions and a scene region. And we will talk about uh, future technology and how Indonesia adapt for uh, new disruptive technologies. Uh, I want to give word for Evie uh, from Innotech and please. More. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Roman. So let me introduce myself. I'm Evie from Innotech Foundation. Good afternoon, Ibu Siti Aziza. Thank you for coming here. Uh, Ibu, thank you for coming also. Who is the from the ministry? Yeah. Okay, uh, dear valuable guests and ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to tell you about uh, Innotech a little bit. Uh, so Indonesia Technology Innovation Foundation is a business incubator. We are founded in Jakarta, January 2008, to support the development of technology innovative startups and small and growing businesses that support bottom of our market. So we are very uh, thank you that uh, we are invited and be a partner for the um, from Asian Start that are uh, want to develop a uh, technology and want to adapt the technology in Indonesia. We are very thank you for that and thank you for Raffles also from JTP Asia uh, in supporting us uh, for every event that uh, uh, delivered in Jakarta. Thank you. Yeah, I give back to Roman. Yeah, I want to give some words for JTP Asia for Raffles. Yeah, I will. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Raffles, yeah. and I'm from GITP. Yeah. So I'm not sure if anyone knows me. So some of you might know yeah. we've been yes, running an event together with uh, Innotech for quite some time. And this is the very first time we work together with um, Start ASEAN by collaborating and organizing an event in Indonesia, Jakarta. And uh, we are the country partners. Like Innotech is the country partner from Indonesia from G with GITP, and Start ASEAN is the country partner basically from the... Um, uh, CIS countries and also they in charge also for wider regions such as MENA and SORA. They will introduce themselves later. So GITP, uh, a brief introduction about us. We are an international incubator and we also work closely with the China government. So we founded in 2021 and we started from the procurement from the China government of doing the international cross-border technology transfer, commercializations, talent acquisitions. And also we organize and co-organize a lot of um, in global entrepreneurship competitions and also um, workshop, exhibitions, summits, forum, and so on. And we also provide um, services, professional services. Um, later on, I'm going to explain more about it. And our basically, our, our main focus is for intellectual property and technology commercialization and technology transfer. So uh, my name is Jack, and uh, I'm a vice president of Start ASEAN. And uh, our mission is to create uh, different events in the ICN region. And by recording those events by video, we are sending this to uh, around the world to our partners. And this is how we think uh, we can uh, promote ICN region. And especially at the moment, we will work with Indonesia and building the bridges. So in, in one case, we can attract someone who will be interesting and know a little bit more about Indonesia. And in, in the same time, local Indonesians can also look into the global expansion. But besides of this, we also like to talk about technology, about the trends of technology and how government, how people, how uh, businesses, startups are using those technology in the correct way to improve their lifestyle, to become more free, become more innovative and uh, having some uh, you know, nice competition games. So this is what our mission is about. This is start this year. So, and I would like to give a few words to Mark Yu. Uh, they uh, um, help us a lot with the setting up all these things and uh, providing a live streaming event today as well yeah. to our partners. So, Andre, please. Okay, thank you, Jack, Roman, uh, Revlas, and also anyone here. Thank you very much. Already come to Marky and Connex here. My name is Andre Satria, and I'm the Community Development Manager of the Connex by Marky. Today, I will introduce you a little bit about Marky, a little bit about Connex, and also a little bit about what we can give, what we can support you guys here. Please, next. Okay, so Connex is uh, next. Connex is one of the uh, service office. Maybe you guys here is uh, familiar with the service office. Yeah, service office. What you guys see right here, so there is the service office that Marky have. So if you guys need a mar service office, you just come to Marky. Okay, and then the Marky itself is a Marky group. It's a big group. Okay, next. 
And the one that you're sitting right now is Costas for the cafe itself. And then this area also can be a wedding, uh, sorry, wedding hall. So everyone who wants to have a wedding, you can join the wedding here and then also out there. And if there's no wedding, this place will be become a cafe and bar. That's Costas. And then if you want to have an event like this, this will be Connex or Marquee. Anything you need, anything you want, Marquee help here. Okay, next. This is where Connex located. We have like a Cyber 2. We have also at the Panok Inda Office Towers, Alamanda at the Tabesi Matupang, and also at the Sovereign Towers. Can, next, this is the detail. Just next, the detailed places. So if you want to have like an event, you can go with us. It's really fun there. Okay, next. It's at the Alamanda Towers, and we have a lot more of the snacks. We have like a sovereign and also another Panokin office tower, but Panokin office tower is already occupied by the office. So right now we can adjust that for the events. Next. And this uh, for the connect itself, I think we have at least at the level 11, we have like a 30, 350 employee itself. So the traffic is around like 300 people every day. And there's like a lot of uh, tech industry there from the Axiata Digital Labs, Coinworks, and anything else. Next, with the basic uh, um, team and theirs, have a background like in the technology, public relations, financial technology, law firm, app developer, and more. Okay, we can move. And our market, it's Connex market. If you want to have a partnership with Connex, uh, we have like a most, you know, 50% is coming from a 25 till 34 years old. And the gender is like a 50-50, but most of them, because it's a tech industry, it's most of them is men. But I think women is also can dominate the tech industry. Okay, and this is what we can support you. First thing, we have like a weekly newsletters. So if you have a brand, you have like a company, you want to put your promotions or brand on our week, uh, newsletters, we send it over to 70,000, 17,000, sorry, 17,000 database that the open rate is about like 10% until 30%. So it's quite like a 2,000 persons at least will open the newsletters. And next, you can put your brand here. We have like a, a, a sponsorship pin. Okay. Yeah. And then we have next. Okay. Sorry. What happens? Okay. Yes. There are some things. Okay. I think here's the problems. Okay. Next. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now, what we can support you, we have also the, co uh, the, the, the corner rooms where you can put your brand there. And then next, we have also uh, local placement for the events. We, uh, we, I, I will quit, I will quit. And then we have another things, let's see. Uh, okay, next. <laughs> now, we also, if you have like an event with us, we can send the event information into at least database of our tenants. It's around 2,500. But what we can give to you next, Okay, next, it's it's just a value partner if you want to partner with us. This one. So if you want to have an event with us with maximum like a 50 packs capacity, you just pay us 2 million and then you will become a partner of us. The maximum uses of the event place is just like eight hours. So eight hours for 2 million is very low in the markets. And then what you need is just put Connex logo in your events, banners, and also mention Connex and the events and let us to have this kind of presentations. Just as simple as that. Okay, then if you are not from the brand or from the company, we have like individual promo. What kind of individual promo? Come on. Now, this is, we have the affiliate program. So everyone here who never have background on the hospitality or uh, selling an even space, you can join the community, become our connector, become our affiliate, affiliators. Maybe people talk there. Every even space that come from your affiliate code or your affiliate link, you will get like 10% from the closing value only for the event space. So our event space is ranged for two, two million until 10 million. So you can see like the 10% of it from 200 until 1 million, you can get, just become our affiliate. So if you're interested to become affiliate, next, you can just scan this barcode as the ID slash connect star strip early, and then you can become our priority persons that I will inform you when this program is launching. So whoever you hear, if you want to get more money, more safe, more 
connections, you can join connectors and become our affiliators. Just scan the QR code and I will inform you while this event or this programs launch. That's all. If you miss the QR code, you can go to the YouTube. We will upload all of this to the YouTube also. And this, if you want to ask me directly to my phone number, you just click ask.id slash Tanya Connects and you will directly chat to me. That's all. My name is Satya. Thank you and enjoy the event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, so let's uh, move on to our first panel discussion where uh, Roman will be moderator. And uh, please invite your panelists yeah. to join. Uh, thank you all. Uh, let's meet our first panel panelist. It's a trade representative of the Russian Federation in the Republic of Indonesia, Alexander Svinin. Um, second panelist is Deputy Minister of Entrepreneurship at Ministry of Cooperatives and SMEs of the Republic of Indonesia, Siti Aziza. There, there is one. Uh, third, third is uh, no, Utilization no. of Science and Technology of Brain, Erida Listian Groom, yes. And Head of Business Development, Amazon IWS, he hasn't far equal. Okay. Thank you all panelists to join our event and uh, we can start. I think we can start in and uh, let's imagine situation that we have two companies from different regions. For example, one company sit in Russia, Moscow, and second company sit in uh, Indonesia. And they are similar. They created solution for artificial intelligence uh, for smart cities, and, but they don't know each other. They don't know how can they start work and how they can uh, create bridges between uh, this side and other side. Uh, right now, I know that uh, business delegation from Russian tech companies are in Jakarta, and yesterday I visited event for them and I saw that a lot of Indonesian companies are interested in uh, collaborative with uh, Russian companies. Alexander, can you tell more about this event, about business mission and about maybe future plan plans? And about how companies from St. Petersburg and Jakarta can find each other. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here. Uh, thanks to all our attendees offline and online. Uh, my name is Alex. I'm the head of the Russian trade mission to Indonesia. Uh, Russian trade mission is the part of the Russian diplomatic mission to Indonesia. So from one hand, we are diplomats. From the another hand, our main goal here is to support Russian companies yeah, that want to enter uh, Indonesian awesome. market. So from the government side, we work to help them to understand how they can work properly on in Indonesia, how they can find reliable partners and how they can uh, establish their entity in Indonesia and even invest money in the Indonesian economy. Uh, we work on the three levels. The first one is G2G. We work very closely with all government officials from the Indonesian side or Ministry for Small and Medium Enterprises, Ministry for Industry, Ministry for Trade, Ministry for Investments. The second one is B2B. We work, as I said, with Russian companies. And the third one, uh, we are more than happy to support any Indonesian company that wants to enter Russian market. Because from my personal perspective, I totally believe that if we'd like to establish long-term cooperation ties between our countries, and we'd like, as Russians, to establish long-term cooperation ties with you, Indonesians, now, we have to have more success stories on the Russian market for Indonesian companies. Once any Indonesian company will be successful on the Russian market, this company will come back to Indonesia and tell everyone, oh, take a look, Russia is a great country, we can do business here, we can earn money, we can find new clients, it's a large, huge market today. Uh, so we are not support only Russian companies, but as well Indonesian companies uh, from from Jakarta to any other city to uh, to expand their business to, to Russia. For example, one month ago, we organized a large business delegation from Indonesia uh, for 55 Indonesian companies. They visited Moscow, St. Petersburg, and other cities, and uh, they have lots of B2B, uh, B2B meetings. Uh, my long story was not about myself, but uh, it was the first answer for one of your questions, how we can connect our companies. The most easiest way today for Indonesian companies to get to know more about Russia is to call me. All my contacts are 
online. Our office is uh, in Imam Banjol. We are open to talk with everyone from Indonesia who wants to do business with Russia or in Russia. The same one you have in Indonesian embassy in, uh, in Moscow. Any Russian company, I totally believe that any Russian company is always uh, welcome in Indonesian embassy in Moscow, and you have a trade attaché in embassy. And uh, of course, we as a government officials, we can do such, such a connections. The second one is, of course, not wasting your time and missing such an opportunities that such communities like uh, Start ASEAN provides you with. We see a huge demand uh, from uh, entrepreneurs from both countries to understand each other better and more and more uh, like social uh, communities and uh, ecosystems appearing from both parties. In Russia, we have maybe three or four focused on ASEAN countries, business communities, and much more uh, are appearing here in Indonesia, not only in Jakarta, but in Bali, Surabaya, and other cities. So the second uh, way to get to know more about each other is to be a part of such an event like we have today. And the third one, I think that um, uh, the main problem for both, uh, from my perspective, we are very similar countries. Indonesia is the fourth largest country in the world by the population. Russia is the largest country by the territory. We have 140 million people. You have 270 million people. Uh, we have 10% of our population Muslims. And all these people are not migrants. They live in our country for hundreds of years. They're integrated in any community, in any uh, class, in any school. You will have people or you have children with different religions, nations, and even languages. So Russians are very tolerant and we understand your culture as you understand our culture. But the main problem is that uh, both of our countries need a time to be more uh, closer to, to each other. You're a very young country. We are a very young country uh, since uh, the Soviet Union collapsed. Our private economy started only, I'm only 35 years, not so old still, but I'm going to this goal, yeah. Uh, but when I was born, uh, if you decided to do business in Russia, uh, you will be taken to the prison for five years. So our private economy is very young. We have only 30 years for our uh, our private companies. And you can see lots of our companies here now but it's 8,000 kilometers from Moscow to, to Jakarta. The same one for you. We, we have, uh, we, we don't, uh, we shouldn't think that we lost some opportunities or I think that uh, only now we have much more opportunities that, that we have before. So the third answer is that we need more time. We, we need to be more active and we need to be more open-minded to each other to understand this. Uh, these business opportunities. From the Russian government, as I said, we are totally believe that we want to work with Indonesian companies. We are open for any Indonesian company on the Russian uh, on the Russian market. So for two companies from St. Petersburg and Jakarta, today, this year, is much more opportunities to be introduced than it was even one year ago. Today, it's much more, much more easy to do. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you for your speech. I totally agree with you, and I agree that Russian uh, nation, I think it's similar like uh, Indonesian, because I now live for more than half a year in Indonesia and understand that we are similar. Uh, okay, uh, now we understand that companies interested in uh, uh, expand their business in global world, for example, uh, Russian companies and Indonesian companies, uh, but we don't know about ecosystem, like, about small and medium enterprises and you know, in Indonesia. City, can you tell us more about uh, ecosystem and how many SME companies work in tech industry right now? Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. So, uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Siti Aziza, but you may call me Aziza. So, I'm Deputy of Mini um, Entrepreneurship in Ministry of uh, SMEs, uh, Small Medium Enterprises. So, uh, discussing about the uh, entrepreneurs is uh, very interesting. In fact, uh, we just uh, developed this unit since uh, 2020, uh, 2029 exactly, and then there is a change in 2020. And the minister uh, developed the uh, entrepreneurship unit, meaning that, uh, you know, this will be the next uh, 
the next era or uh, we need to have uh, somebody who take care of uh, the entrepreneurs. And, when, and the second is uh, if we are just talking about entrepreneurs, it's very huge. So, uh, but what we are looking for right now is the uh, entrepreneur who can build, uh, develop the business uh, based on the plan. So it's based on by design. So hopefully we can uh, get the uh, high tech uh, or techy. So uh, like uh, today, we uh, already, uh, I think they have about uh, three, more than 300 startup, which is uh, that's 100% uh, technology based uh, companies. Uh, and uh, you know what we are looking uh, for them is uh, on the 2021, we do some incubation with uh, several incubators in Indonesia. And then, uh, you know, uh, today we are looking at the uh, startup go global, meaning that uh, we see the opportunity outside and we also want to bring them uh, to the next level. So that on the uh, startup and entrepreneurs. So if you are talking about the SME itself, Currently, we have about 64 million SMEs uh, from micro to middle. But 99% of those uh, uh, SMEs are micro, meaning that they are mostly necessity entrepreneur where they build their business based on needs. So if uh, we understand fully on the situation last two years where the COVID, uh, you know, everywhere, including Indonesia, so a lot of uh, entrepreneurs uh, develop uh, by needs. They need to have their own business because of the situation. But now uh, we are uh, thankful that because of them, we are still alive. I mean, the, you know, the economics still uh, very good. We are very strong. So 99% of this micro, they are mostly on the f and And then, uh, you know, out of these uh, 64%, uh, 64 million, about 65% is women. So women entrepreneur is very, very huge, huge in Indonesia. Indonesia. And we know that, that, that uh, they, need they need to learn, learn how to, to go to the technology side because, because we know, know women is uh, a bit lag on that one. So uh, again, back to the SMEs uh, with this uh, 64 uh, million. So we are looking at actually about uh, 3 to 4% entrepreneurs. And then currently we are not there yet. Uh, we are uh, you know targeting on the 3.95 next year. So I think that's uh, that's a bit about uh, you know SMEs in Indonesia. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Aziza. I think it's a huge ecosystem here. Um, and what about programs for companies who want to become a global companies who want to expand their product for uh, different other regions? Maybe Arida, can you tell more about uh, uh, bring activities and bring programs for uh, entrepreneurs in Indonesia? Thank you, Roman. Um, first of all, let me introduce myself. I am Erida from a National Research and Innovation Agency, or in Indonesia, we call it BRIN. BRIN is a new entity, new organization in Indonesia, maybe some of you are not familiar with. So it is a research institution, actually, in Indonesia that consists of several research institutions. So uh, currently we are home for uh, 15,000 researchers in Indonesia. One of our activities is to support a startup company based on technology. So what makes the difference between a uh, brain program and uh, ministry of uh, SMEs is uh, our startup is based on uh, technology that generated by researchers under brain. So startup must uh, collaborate with our researchers before they entering our program. So that's the the requirement for the startup to join oh, the program. Yeah. So uh, that's the initiative from our um, uh, our institution to support um, uh, commercialization technology in Indonesia. Okay. okay. And uh, what I do in daily activity is coaching and mentoring for startup. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Rita. Uh, I understand that we have a lot of opportunities for companies in Indonesia and in other regions. And uh, after we understand that we can create, create bridges, we understand that we need some infrastructure. And uh, we have a uh, head of business development of Amazon IWS, Haas. Can you tell more about uh, opportunities of uh, Amazon IWS for tech companies and what are you doing in Jakarta right now? Because I think that you work in Malaysia. 
Yeah, uh, thank you for having me over here. Good question to start. I mean, thank you to GITP, Start ASEAN, and InnoTech, uh, the organizers, Marty. Uh, so I wasn't part of this panel three days ago, and I was on a flight to Jakarta with Rafael, and he told me about this uh, program. And I have an, another event after this, so <laughs> we have to be quick. But a uh, bit about myself. Yes, I'm based in Kuala Lumpur. I look after the business development side uh, for Amazon Web Services. Originally, I'm from Pakistan. Uh, but right now, I manage Pakistan, Malaysia, and Indonesia, three markets. So uh, there's a lot of back and forth between Kuala Lumpur and Jakarta. Uh, I work closely with uh, VCs, venture capitalists, accelerators, and incubators uh, in running different programs. Uh, Ex-founder myself, I uh, have been also funded by Antler, had worked in a unicorn from the Middle East. So uh, I've been on that side of the startup ecosystem where I created a startup. I took an exit from the startup. I worked in a unicorn and now I'm working in the big tech side. So uh, this gives me a great kind of an insight in terms of how the business is running. Uh, Jakarta is a new market for me, but very exciting market. Uh, like uh, the panelists mentioned, 280 million population, huge size, huge scale. And if you ask me, any startup that wants to be successful in ASEAN, they have to open up a shop in Indonesia. If they are not in Indonesia, they are not going to scale. Uh, now, coming to your question in terms of uh, what programs or what opportunities are out there. So in Amazon Web Services, uh, we provide nine programs to support the startup ecosystem, starting from providing activate credits. Uh, so these activate credits uh, start anywhere from $1,000 all the way to $100,000 uh, that you can utilize if you have been funded by a VC, if you are associated with any of the accelerator or incubator, or if you know any of our AWS scouts, these are startup influencers in different ecosystems that can provide you these credits. Now, this is not a direct funding into your startup, but this gives you kind of indirect money because then you can save your capital and that you can divert in investing and scaling your uh, companies. Uh, so this is the one of the things. Then we have several programs for early stage startups, startups that have a product market fit and then startups that are scaling that are on the unicorn stage. Uh, if I talk about my team, so we are 200 plus business development folks all around the world. Most of us are ex-founders or ex-VCs. So for example, if you want to scale outside Indonesia into ASEAN or let's say into US or Russia as well. So we have business development team over there that we can connect you with. If you are looking for some sort of best practices, so we have around 83% of the unicorns across the globe building on AWS. So we have a lot of data points that can help you in that regards as well. We can connect you over there. Uh, then there is Capital Connect, right? So you have VCs over here in Indonesia and in this ecosystem, uh, all the uh, notable names like East Ventures, Alpha JWC, ACV, Kajora, so on and so forth. We are working with them, but we are working with similar VCs in Malaysia or Singapore, in Pakistan, in Russia, in US, UK, everywhere. So if you're looking to grow into those markets and you look, you're looking for the funding, uh, you can come to us, we, we can connect you with them. Obviously we don't guarantee the funding, but we can open up those doors for you. We can open up those opportunities that you can uh, scale on. Then it comes to tech infrastructure. So most of the founders right now, I mean, going through this macroeconomic situation, everybody is talking about cost optimization, right? And tech is a huge cost for building on cloud. Obviously, if you can cut some of the cost over there, then you can, you know, again, put that cost somewhere else, invest it into something else in terms of commercializing or scaling your companies. So we do all of these cost optimization workshops where we tell you what kind of a tech architecture to put on your cloud that is more efficient, more refined, more structured that can help you scale uh, rapidly. So these are a few of the programs that we run internally, but then externally we support a lot. Uh, recently we uh, started a Gen AI accelerator program uh, globally for which I think 300 plus startups applied and 20 got uh, shortlisted. So now these 20 startups are going to go through all of the platform technologies that we have over there in terms of training, in terms of getting the exposure, the partners that we are working on, the customers that we are working on, that kind of exposure you can get through our AWS services. Uh, lastly, I mean, it's all about the ask that what does a startup requires? Sometimes they don't even know what they require, right? Yes, so yes, I, yes, I need to know problem. What, what exactly is your ask and 99% of the time, given our global network, we can leverage on that and we can actually support you guys.
Okay, it's so interesting because right now we understand that we can create bridges, we can build this bridge, and we understand that we have opportunities for creating these bridges. But um, let's talk about maybe challenges and what are the major challenges I see in entrepreneurs face when expanding to global markets. Aziza, maybe you can help us with that. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, what we learned from Indonesian uh, entrepreneurs is uh, when, uh, when they want to go global, they actually need to understand what kind of market they are planning to move in. So they need to learn what are, what are the product or services they need. The second one is uh, to go global, they need a lot of uh, investment, of, of course. And uh, this one, they need to have an access to the financial uh, companies or if they do have it, that's good. Uh, so what we are looking at, uh, what we are seeing here is uh, some of this, uh, most of the startup, they do not have the uh, clearly business plan uh, in the long run, uh, financial planning, and then what uh, they will look like in five or seven years. So that when we are actually working with uh, some uh, incubators, to give them a very early basic knowledge on how to build a business plan uh, like that. So this year, we are going to connect them directly with the global market. So we are, we are, have, we are we'll have the uh, demo day for the uh, 150 startup that will be done in the August, September. And we will invite the uh, global market, global incubator to give them uh, understanding uh, what is what will be the uh, global market look like and the third one is uh, beside the access to finance they also need to understand what is the uh, logistic infrastructure including te technology that uh, might be need uh, with uh, for them to be able to go to global because uh, we know that uh, it's not that difficult but it's not that easy as well so that's why uh, startups need to learn a lot on this uh, three, uh, three uh, things. Lastly, it's about the uh, government access and government support, definitely. So uh, we, uh, we work with uh, other ministry and, uh, of course, with BRIN to develop, uh, to help them uh, doing R&D and then uh, make a product, production, mass, and commercialize. So uh, what uh, my point here is uh, definitely government need to support them. So I think uh, that's all. Thank yeah, you. thank you, Aziza. And Alexander, what do you think about Russian companies? I work a lot with Russian company and I understand that they uh, have problem, I think, with open mining. I think they don't understand that uh, our world is not so huge and we can find a lot of opportunities in different regions. What do you think about that? Uh, I think the main problem in Berkia for Russian entrepreneurs uh, for working abroad is the size of our local. Yes, yes. Okay, yeah, change. Sorry. I think uh, in Russia we have one hundred forty million people. GDP per capita in Russia is uh, approximately fifteen thousand USD, three times more than uh, you have in ASEAN. Uh, uh, the oil price is high, uh, so we can buy lots of import and. Uh, uh, when you have such a large internal market, growing market, because Russia is well developing and growing country, uh, uh, sometimes you don't have to take a look outside this country because it takes time once you come to even 10% of the market share on your local market. Why do you have to go abroad? You can earn money inside the country. That's the main barrier for Russian entrepreneurs, I think, to even to think about how to work outside the country. But uh, the situation was, uh, I think, much more worse uh, 10 years ago. For now, we have lots of very active Russian entrepreneurs working outside our country. And uh, for example, only to Indonesia this year, uh, uh, more than 500 Russian companies will come in person to see how they can work in Indonesia only for Indonesia, 500 companies. Of course, 10 times more to China, of course, 10 times more to India, of course, 
approximately the same to uh, Middle East and so on and so forth. Of course, from these 500 companies, we will have, you know, if you're in business, that's uh, only five success stories. But every year, five, 10, 15, they, take, they will take more and more and more companies to, to be here. And uh, in Russia, we have the special national project from our government to support our export oriented entrepreneurs. And we provide them with the financial uh, resources. We provide them with an insurance. We provide them with a log logistic uh, subsidy. We, we subsidize them uh, some, some part of the logistic. And we even subsidize them, uh, their attendees in different exhibitions and uh, forums uh, all around the world. So from the government side, we have uh, instruments to support them. We have today much more vision from their side that they have and they can. And it's not so difficult for them to build not only national company, but multinational company. Again, what we need, a little bit more time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I agree with you. So um, let's talk about maybe events, events for uh, tech companies, because uh, our mission of our organization, Start ASEAN, is to uh, create bridges uh, between other regions. And now I think our events can show companies for our online translation. Uh, information about that it's not uh, difficult to start their business in indonesia and you taught us that uh 500 companies yeah directly meet uh, have meeting in oh nice it's a lot it's a huge number of companies i think okay uh Arida, what do you think about events uh what can we provide for camp for foreign companies uh and how can we maybe provide new events for um uh, organization who want to start their business in Indonesia. Maybe Brin can help with that. What do you think? Yeah, uh, before I jump to your question, maybe I will explain a little, a little bit more about our startup. Currently um, in my division, nurturing more than 60 startup-based technology that generated by researcher at Brin itself. And then we provide uh, a lot of kind of facilities. For example, startup uh, can eligible for maximum 300 million rupees for a year. And then we also provide another facilities like um, okay. they can test uh, their product to our uh, laboratory and also they can participate to our international event. For example, in this September, we will uh, help um, international expo called Indonesia Research and Innovation Expo in Cibinong in September. And then we also uh, invite our startup to join at, uh, for example, ASEAN India Innovation uh, Competition. Like we have here, Mr. Um, Henry also joined. He is uh, one of my startup under Brin uh, coordination. Uh, and then we also support a startup to facilitate in um, global network. For example, we, we also collaborate with international incubator as well for self learning program. So that's kind of um, activities that uh, Brin does. And uh, to conclude, we are very welcome to collaborate with Russia or, or other organization like International Incubator, for example. We are very welcome. Okay. And uh, another, uh, maybe yeah, another yeah. just short uh, announcement, for example, maybe uh, some of you guys um, have startup and already set the startup. Brin, now open submission if you want to apply our program and join at, uh, for incubation program. You can uh, apply your proposal and the deadline is 30 June. Okay, uh, I think you have a lot of, uh, a lot of activities. And what about uh, Amazon? Do you have uh, events? Do, do you plan to provide some events in Jakarta? Man, I'm doing non-stop events. I, yeah, 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 I know, I know. <laughs> I have to check my LinkedIn. Um, yes, I check your LinkedIn yeah. every day and like post from even different events from different parts of the world, I think. Yeah, and maybe we should, you know, partner. Uh, why are you not our activate partner, right? I mean, we should exchange cards later on. Uh, in, in terms of the events, uh, so like I said that we do a lot of accelerator programs, but we sponsor events and we do first party events as well. First party events at our AWS office in Jakarta, uh, I recently uh, ran a CTO jam. Uh, it's like where we provide the engineers that used to be working uh, in silos and now they are running the companies from the technical end, but they miss 
the engineering part of it. So we gather all of these CTOs, one of them presents uh, their use case in terms of what they are building on. And then we open it up in discussion. It's run by our technical team. Uh, then we do uh, Cloud Day, which is our annual event where we provide enterprises, SMBs, SMEs, startups, everybody under one roof to talk more about the innovations that are happening in the cloud. Uh, then on the VC side, I recently did a greet and grow session for the FinTech VCs. Uh, oh, no, this so one of the so interesting number that I would like the, to share that last year, 85% of the VC funding the happened in three countries like in ASEAN, there, Singapore, in Malaysia, time, and Vietnam. So these are big countries where VCs oh, no, 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 are focusing on. And then the, there's the, another interesting number that since 2022 to no, date, uh, out of $2.6 billion of VC funding in Indonesia, 1.5 has been in FinTech. So we see fintech. Uh, we are very bullish about fintech. That it's a huge opportunity uh, for Indonesia. A lot of startups are uh, working on it. So we are running fintech roundtables and a couple of events over there. But we also partner with our VCs, accelerator incubators in terms of what they want, what they want us to run, uh, and how we can sponsor, how we can support. Uh, we also do not just events, but we help different partners in creating use case studies. So what they are building on, what are the best practices that we can share with other founders out there? And then we work on different playbooks. Right now with one of the VCs, we are working on a product market playbook, right? So what is the best way, best strategy to approach and find the right product market? Like you mentioned earlier about the challenges on the founder side. So, I mean, product market fit is always a challenge over there because the technology is constantly revolving. New yes. innovations coming in. And every month, to, yeah, every month, I every think. Every month, like, yeah. I mean, if we talk about Gen A every day. Yes. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, even we don't have the skill set right now to understand what is happening. I mean, I'm talking on a big tech level. So what is happening in the startup phase? So everything is changing. You need to keep yourself updated, especially if you are a founder, right? So we do these different events where we train them constantly about the new technologies, what to look after, what are some of the opportunity pockets that you can actually capitalize on. Also, not just to focus on one market, focus on multiple markets, Right, because for instance, in Pakistan, there is a, a huge inflation going on. There are a lot of challenges. So if a founder is just connected with one country, they will not be able to grow. So you need to think big, need to think regionally, right? And globally as well. So you can have that long-term game. And uh, so all of that is provided through our mentorship and different events and programs. Okay, you thank, you, Hass. thank you, Hass. Thank you, uh, We have only five minutes uh, for finish our uh, panel discussion. Let's talk with the audience. Uh, maybe some entrepreneurs want to uh, give some questions for panelists. Just uh, like this, raise the hand. No? You know, ideally, before you ask the last question to the panelists, you should just throw in that I'm asking the last question and then I will open it up to the floor if the people prepare for the question. Oh. <laughs> okay. Pro tip. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, let's finish. Uh, thank you, all panelists. And. Uh, oh, okay, okay. Excuse me. One is in Ibu. Maybe in Bahasa, okay. Thank you for uh, the opportunity. Uh, terima kasih, Ibu, dan kawan-kawan semua yang ada di sini. Nama saya Adi Kurniawan. Uh, saya membawa startup Triangle. Jadi, berangkat dari apa? Uh, uh, value creation. Jadi, Uh, lebih dari sekedar ahli, ada yang lebih penting dari sekedar ahli. Seperti itu. Uh, kebetulan startup ini saya bangun memang karena waktu itu saya perjalanannya kan dari apa sempat ikut survei-survei juga di BPS, kemudian di beberapa instansi kayak Kemenkop UKM juga. Uh, saya bangun startup ini by apa basisnya data gitu. Nah, pertanyaan saya yang ingin saya tanyakan pada founder-founder yang ada di sini itu uh, terkait dengan startup saya itu kan basisnya data by behavior. Behavior. Jadi apa yang saya ambil sampel-sampelnya itu tentang Bagaimana sih? Hmm, okay. Kenapa sih orang mau beli? Gitu. 
mau beli suatu barang, apa sih yang menarik buat mereka gitu. Itu salah satunya yang sedang saya kembangkan di situ. Terus selain itu, data-data sampelnya kita ambil melalui apa kuesioner yang basisnya sektoral. Gitu. Jadi kita door to door gitu, apa pakai kuesioner kecil-kecilan gitu, sama teman-teman dari kawan-kawan mahasiswa juga. Nah itu kira-kira uh, pertanyaan saya tadi, gimana uh, selain konsep sektoral ini, apakah masih relevan gitu dipakai gitu. Sedangkan sekarang kan kemajuan teknologinya udah sampai marketing 4.0 ya gitu. Basisnya adalah komunitas seperti ini. Kemudian basisnya bukan si penjual lagi tapi basisnya si pembeli. Pembeli itu benar-benar aja ini saat ini. Itu jadi review dikit aja salah, hancurlah usaha kita gitu. Jadi Uh, pertanyaan saya itu tadi kira-kira sampel-sampel ya seperti sektoral itu apa masih bisa relevan atau ada masukan-masukan lain gitu untuk startup saya terima kasih thank you oke okay, uh, thank you uh, I think no questions yet it's without questions ah oh, yeah <laughs> okay let, let me start should I uh, answer in English or English Oke, okay, bahasa Indonesia aja ya, Pak, supaya lebih mantap. Oke, okay. so I will translate you later. Uh, sebetulnya kalau Bapak bicara mengenai startup, itu tidak ada yang salah, Pak. Selama Bapak tahu produk atau servisnya nanti, siapa yang akan menggunakan. Nah, saya sangat tertarik dengan tadi Bapak sampaikan bahwa Bapak membuat aplikasi yang seolah-olah untuk buying behavior ya, Pak. Jadi Bapak ingin mengetahui buying behavior pattern dari orang-orang yang Bapak survei. Nah, itu sebetulnya sangat luar biasa kalau kemudian Bapak jadikan itu menjadi satu aplikasi yang bisa digunakan oleh para pelaku UMKM. Jadi saya berikan contoh, kita juga sedang survei, Pak, sejak tahun yang lalu. Kita melakukan survei tapi pendataan pelaku. Nah, kalau Bapak bisa menggabungkan itu akan jauh lebih perfect. Jadi poin saya adalah startup yang Bapak buat itu sudah menurut saya sangat luar biasa karena berdasarkan database. Jadi base dari data behavior pembeli. Nah, dengan adanya banyak disrupsi teknologi ini, sebetulnya tidak merubah behavior orang, Pak. Hanya cara orangnya sekarang berbeda. Kalau dulu saya belanja, saya datangnya ke toko, Pak. Kalau sekarang e-commerce. Nah, itu yang harus Bapak pelajari. Bagaimana perubahan itu bisa digunakan melalui aplikasi Bapak. Atau dengan kata lain, kalau uh, pembeli produk Bapak nanti adalah pelaku UMKM, bagaimana pelaku UMKM ini bisa melihat aplikasi itu untuk membantu bisnisnya. Gitu ya Pak. Jadi tetap semangat. Kalau Bapak akan bergabung dengan kami, lokasi Bapak di mana, cari inkubatornya, akan kita uh, akan kita fasilitasi beberapa inkubator, Pak. So basically, uh, the question is, the, this, uh, Bapak siapa, Pak? Maaf. Oh, so Mr. Andre is uh, developing the uh, startup, which is mainly uh, to provide apps uh, to to make uh, the uh, buying behavior pattern. So they are ba based on data that they survey directly to the customer, of course. So the question is whether this, uh, you know, this uh, this way is uh, still uh, updated, or they need to change it. So my answer is uh, that's very good because they are building something based on data, which is, is very expensive if uh, you know if you want to do it, and uh, their survey is directly to the customers. So uh, I suggest to Pak Andri actually there is no right and wrong developing the business depending on what is their business uh, will be, who is their customer, and then how they gonna do it. So I suggest to him. If uh, you know they want to join us, we are welcome because we have a lot of uh, uh, incubators uh, out of uh, you know uh, from east to west. So Selindo, Pak, seluruh Indonesia. So uh, they uh, can uh, uh, join us. So that's the question. Thank you.
Okay, uh, thank you very much for questions. Thank you for panelists for uh, participating in our uh, yeah, panel discussion. Uh, let's finish and uh, let's discuss about how Indonesia adapt for disruptive technologies. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you very much, thank you. Let's make a photo. Let's make a photo, yeah. Thank you so much. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we will send you the recording of the next one of discussions. Should be about strength. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you. What do you think? Is that? Okay. 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 You know, and then we go to the next discussion where we we'll talk about technology and uh, we will have some uh, real fun of diving in different uh, different cases. So, yeah, around half an hour, 40 minutes. Uh, and then uh, I will uh, walk around and try to put back together in this. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank okay. you. Buat teman-teman semua silakan kafe break dulu, minum. Kita akan break. Start berapa menit? Start start start. What? Hold on to break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Start some minutes. Start some start some start some. Start some minutes. Too much. Too much. Okay. Fifty. Uh, Where is the second? Oh, no. Start. Ah, oh, no, no, no. Where is the speaker? Where is the? Come on, one. I think fifteen minutes. Yeah, I will. I will tell them. I will tell them. Okay. Oke, okay. kita akan rest sekitar 20 menit ya, teman-teman. Jadi bisa langsung kafe dulu, itu di belakang ada snack, ada kafe and tea. 20 menit, habis itu kita langsung, langsung mulai, mulai ke panel selanjutnya. Panel selanjutnya. Thank, you. Thank you. For everyone, For here, everyone here, here, we have like a 20 minutes, minutes rest. So, so everyone, everyone can, can go to uh, the bar room. You want to take the snacks or something, kafe and tea, just take that. And we will start again in 20 minutes. Thank you, everyone.
Ini harus sebentar lagi, Pak. Oke, teman-teman, sesaat lagi acara akan dimulai. Silakan menempati tempat duduk yang sudah disediakan. Teman-teman semuanya, saya persilakan boleh kok bawa makanannya ke tempat duduk yang sudah ada. Saya persilakan yang masih ada di belakang, yang masih berdiri, boleh sambil bawa makanannya, boleh sambil duduk juga, silahkan. Perlu diingatkan juga untuk teman-teman jika keluar dari area ini. Area yang di luar adalah area berbayar. Jadi mohon maaf kalau ada yang keluar duduk itu boleh transaksi ST aja. Silakan aku nggak apa-apa. Tapi tolong duduk karena memang eh, ditakutkan ada pelanggan lain yang datang ke kafe. Terima kasih banyak. Oke, okay, guys. Uh, so, how about we move to the second final discussion? And uh, the second part discussion will be about uh, technology. We will uh, dive deep into how uh, 
we see the future of technology, how we use the technology, and we will brainstorm and do some visioning. So this will be very dynamic event. So upon the discussion, there is no uh, like restrictions. I will try to hold everyone into one direction. So first of all, I would like to invite here Mr. Uh, Indra Uno from uh, Inotech Foundation. Not here. Okay, he's. Uh... Okay, okay, he's coming. He's coming. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Indra Uno, did I correct your name? No. Okay, maybe um, he's not here. I cannot see him. Okay. Then we uh, move to next uh, uh, panelist, Mr. Yuvenko Pospolur-Pesi from the Sky Star Capital. So, sound here? No. Okay. So then we move to next one. It's from it's uh, from Orbit Future Academy. Uh, Nalim Sain. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, then we have uh, Mr. Raffle from JTP Asia, where he is. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I thought I'll be giving a speech. Today. It's okay. I got your yeah. mind. No worries, man. Cheers. So um, I'm, I'm actually missing, missing two missing panelists, two panelists here, here, which is okay. Is we, okay. Will, uh, we will uh, dive into we'll dive something into else. I have one guy from the one guy from who the, can represent the AI. Represent the AI. Yeah. 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 We'll ask, ask him to, to join us. us. You speak so I have uh, always plans. So I'm backing up with this person. He is the student uh, from the AI technology, right? So you will uh, sit there and you will soon introduce yourself. So we're missing one more panelist. Maybe somebody wants to be a part of this panel discussion and we can dive a bit more into the technology cases. No? Sound from Minotech? No? Okay. Fine. Then we'll do it. Um, we'll do it for us. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Raffle, can you please introduce yourself and uh, tell us about your uh, business and uh, how how things are going? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for staying. Okay. Thank you for staying. I think I already did my brief introduction just now. So uh, maybe some of you are new here. And thank you for joining us. And this is a uh, very first time that JITP working closely together with Start ASEAN and to do the events here to talk about AI. I believe like you guys staying here because you guys want to know more about the AI implementations, how it can change the current world right now, especially most of us, we know about ChatGPT, right? So basically, um, JITP, uh, JITP right now, we are working closely about AI. We are implementing into our workforce and basically our work 70% uh, operate and run by the AI, okay? So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it later, but we are much more focusing on international commercializations, starting from the government procurements from China. And we also work closely with other countries as well, including what Start ASEAN, they used to be our country partner, Inotech as well. And Marky and Connex has been supporting us for a really long time. And once again, thank you so much for staying. And that's all about me and yeah. I will yeah. speak more about it later. Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Raffle. So I would like to, uh, if uh, Nalim, you did correct your name, Nalim Kassain from Orbit Future Academy. I think uh, you have uh, very broad uh, experiences uh, into different fields, as, as also for entrepreneurs, and you also been in Fortune 500 as a CEOs. Yes. Okay. Can you please give us a few words more about your experience? So at my age, most of the best things that I've done are in the past. What I'm doing now in Orbit is uh, important and relevant. Orbit is a large-scale nationwide skilling company. We skill people on Industry 4.0 curriculum with a very important focus on giving them the desired outcome. So one of our strong beliefs is if a student comes to study with you and they pass out, if they don't get the desired outcome, which is either they get a job or they become an entrepreneur and create jobs, then we have failed. We should give them back their money. And that's why universities are failing all over the world. So we are basically a skilling company focused on industry 4.0 with a philosophy that the student must get the desired outcome. Okay, thank you very much. So we have actually a student here. 
No? Yeah, it's, 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 tell, tell a little bit about uh, yourself. And uh, you, you, you speak English, and I know that you're studying AI. Yes? Come on, try it. No? Maybe your computer introduced you, the AI in it. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about introduce yourself and what kind of like focus you want to study about it. So let me maybe ask a question. So why did you why did you choose uh, to study as an AI uh, engineer? Because my mom forced me. My mom forced me. His mom forced him. Uh, you, your mom forced you. Okay, okay. Where is your mom? Starbucks okay. Right now. Okay, 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 fine. All right, uh, then um, actually we have uh, some panelists who is on the way because uh, we start uh, a bit early than uh, other panelists uh, knew it because actually we have to start at 3.30 this panel discussion. So I think uh, what we can do is we can just uh, warming up a little bit and uh, having some uh, game around here in the, with, the, uh, panel, uh, with the audience. And then waiting until some uh, our panelists will arrive. They are on the way. So um, maybe anyone have some questions from the from the audience? Uh, we can answer, or um, maybe I can ask some questions to the audience. Yes, have? No, no one have. Okay. How many of you try using ChatGPT? Okay. Uh, how how uh, how many of you? They try to use Mid Journey. Mid Journey. Mid Journey. Uh, Mid Journey is to it's it's a platform to generate the photos. So you can actually uh, describe something in the in the in the ChatGPT. For example, you can say, "Please create me a prompt uh, of me uh, or like uh, ice cream flying from the Mars while ants are eating." So you can give these things to the Chat GPT and Chat GPT will create a prompt for you, which you can use in Mid Journey, and then Mid Journey will generate the photo. I guess you saw in the internet a lot of photos uh, from the Mid Journey. So that's uh, things. Uh, can I ask you also a question about uh, how do you see you will implement the uh, artificial intelligence into the academy or into the universities? Do you see some? So when we talk of uh, technologies like AI, it needs four elements. I call it DIRT, D-I-R-T. One, it needs a lot of data. All this AI, et cetera, has been around for 20 years plus, but it's only now that there is such abundance of data that it can actually result in any product. The first pillar it needs is data. The second pillar it needs is infrastructure. It needs a network. It needs computing power. Now, all this excitement about AI and chat GPT sitting in Jakarta is all very good. But internet penetration in Indonesia, even today, is only 76%. With 4G, even lower than that. The world has moved to 5G. So there's a lot of work to be done on infrastructure. The third part, pillar is regulation, where governments today have to decide how they will, we will coexist with AI. What are the dangers? What are the positives? How can we use it for better quality of healthcare, education, and things like that, and avoid the pitfalls where AI takes control of our lives? Because that is equally possible. And the last alphabet T of dirt is the most difficult to achieve, which is talent. As much as we may have bold statements that in 2045, we will be a developed country, with mastery over science and technology and developed human capital. We are 22 years away from that. If in most countries, most people achieve the peak of their professional career around the age of 45, where do you think those people who are going to make us a developed country in 2045 are today? They are on the campus like him. Our focus has to be there on the campus. On talent, we are woefully, woefully short. In the previous panel discussion, I heard about this wonderful investments coming to startups. Utter nonsense. 
most of those investments came to those big unicorn startups. You remove that, less than $100 million came to Indonesia. And most of that money went to startups founded by people who studied overseas with copycat ideas, no original ideas. So let's not fool ourselves when we sit in the same country. Talent is poor. All the unicorns are owned by foreign companies. All the technology development centers are in Bangalore, India, not in Jakarta. What AI, what developed capital, what mastery over science and technology, if we don't teach it at the bottommost level and equip teachers to teach it, that is where we will fail, I think, the talent piece of it. We must put, for example, we need radical measures, right? Technology is changing so fast. If six months ago he stood up and said, chat GPT, we would be looking at each other. Today it is essential technology. So if we don't take radical measures, we will not succeed. For example, why not ask all the Indonesian technology talent that has gone overseas, why not incentivize them and force them to come back here? Why not ask all unicorns and technology companies to stop offshoring overseas? For Indonesia, in Indonesia. We have done that in mining. We, we have done that in oil. We don't allow foreign companies to take commodity. We want them to do value addition here. Why not in technology? Why are we sending them overseas? But when you say overseas, it's like to other Asian countries or overseas like the United States, anywhere India. outside Indonesia. Our talent should create our products. Either we are sending our talent out or we are exporting the work, work or, or we are importing talent, talent from places talent, like yes. India, etc. This is wrong. This is wrong. This is it has to stop. But, but when, when you speak about, about talents, talents and, and, and the talents, it's a human, right? It's a human. Sometimes, you know, uh, the talent can be, it's an, uh, it's an accident by their nature. You know, like 2% of all the people are talented. The rest of them, they're less talented. Yeah. So, and uh, when we look into the right mindset of the human being Indonesian or, you know, Russian or European or American, isn't this that everything have to start from the, the childhood? how they get brought up, which kind of, you know, atmosphere they had. So their mission is not leaving the country, but they are goals to create a family here in Indonesia and 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 do something for their children to, to also get to the next. So maybe the problem is is actually coming from very, very uh, roots of the, of the, of the. I agree with you, you know, uh, there is a mindset issue. There is a lack of understanding of how education will lead to financial freedom. There is an overall lower financial literacy level also, right? After only half of Indonesian adults have bank accounts. There, there are larger issues there, but we cannot wait for mindset shift at the bottom level to start and to give us results 40 years from now, because that then we have passed our 2045 target and gone to 2065 target. We need to make those changes, radical changes in batches, in pieces now. And that can start from Jakarta, that can start from other places, but that movement I don't think can wait. And we cannot push it away saying we need mindset shift, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If we see the two technology revolutions, one that took place in the 1990s and 2000s, we missed it from Indonesia. We missed it. Countries like uh, India, China, even Vietnam took advantage of that. This time, the government has got the timing right. They are doing the right things. They're setting up infrastructure. They're putting policies and regulations. They're doing a lot of work, which is not visible to us. The opportunity today, because of advancement in computer technology and network, we can jump the 30 years gap that we have got in three to five years. For that, we need a nationwide movement to skill our people, not put them through five-year college degrees, which get them nothing. So my question is like, how do you see that the technology and the government and education? Did you start any conversation about this with some government representative that you actually uh, have some ideas or some programs you would like to implement through the polit politicians, for example, via technology to the uh, th those uh, group of people, you know, who can actually get to the next uh, move. Do you have some... Uh... So, 
one thing I would say, because I speak to a lot of governments across the world, the Indonesian government right now is very progressive. They have put programs. Whether you go to Ministry of Manpower, Ministry of Education, you go there, there are programs that are teaching subjects like AI, cloud, et cetera, to thousands of university students for free. The mindset is so different here that the government pays the student to attend the class. Nowhere else in the world. That's the mindset issue, right? I give, I'll give you an example. The AWS gentleman was sitting in the previous panel. Orbit Future Academy is a partner for AWS Restart, a program which trains unemployed people from any background for 12 weeks on cloud computing and gives them a guaranteed job at the end of it. Think of it. Last year, we did 1,000 people. Now, let me give you a, a comparison, which comes to mindset, right? Same program was launched in India. 30 seats. For 30 seats, 150,000 people applied. And there were, there were queues outside the office. They were calling the AWS president in America and saying, take me in the program. Indonesia, I opened 30 seats. I got 140 applications. Out of 30, 20 dropped out in the first month. Free program, guaranteed job. This is the response. So uh, I would like to uh, welcome the, from uh, Inotech, correct? Um, Mr. Undo, yeah, hey, Jack. Yes, yes. So so please have a seat. So we've been uh, talking and uh, waiting for, uh, actually we're missing one more panelist, but it's okay. We can uh, move uh, and uh, start slowly. So um, how about you introduce yourself a little bit more and uh, tell you about your experiences being a director of Inotech Foundation. Hi everyone, my name is Indra Urno. Pleased to meet every one of you and hope to be able to communicate more with you. How do we do that? How do we do that? Instagram, no? <laughs> okay, I'll give you my Instagram address later on, but basically it's just very simple, at Indra Uno. You follow me and I will follow you back. Is, is that okay? But you have to say that this, uh, the ASEAN Networking Conference, and then you say, please follow back, okay? Then I will follow you back. And everything is there. <laughs> so that's the best way to introduce. So <laughs> I actually have uh, one follow-up uh, questions to all of you. Yeah. So let's um, you know, let's imagine that um, let, well, not 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 we can imagine, but the question is why uh, in the space in the space uh, they only using Linux? Do you have an answer for it? I didn't get the question. And the question is why in the spacecraft people are using Linux? No, no idea. Why are they using Linux? Is this open source? Uh, maybe. maybe. Good, 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 good answer. answer. But close. You have answer now? You have maybe? What's a cleaner? What's a what? What was the cleaner? They used what? A Lin Linux. Linux. You know, oh, operating Linux. systems. Okay, Linux. Why okay. are you using Linux? Uh, it's uh, more security. Very close, but uh, they cannot use Windows because you cannot open Windows. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that was meant to be a joke. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> so I would like to give, um, um, I would like to continue in our conversation. And we actually uh, was talking about um, technology and how the technology is slowly going to our lives. Uh, how the government uh, is uh, reacting on the technology, how they're reacting on the talents, how they're reacting in the academy. And we already touched upon some problems that uh, uh, if, you look, if you compare Indonesia to other countries, Indonesia is not really taking off of being a more as a startup country and, um, and things like this. But I have ruffles here. 
because and Raffle actually uh, I introduced to Raffle ChatGPT three months ago, and now he's big fan of AI stuff. <laughs> so maybe Raffle, you can tell us some of your experiences and why did you catch up so much with the AI and how it's make your business better? Yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you so much for introducing ChatGPT to me, like for the uh, past five months ago. So I've been catching up with AI in terms of my life. So basically my life changed so much. My business changed, business model changed, the business services changed. So, okay, how, how many of you use more than ChatGPT? More than ChatGPT? Okay, not many of you. Okay, just want to tell you guys, there are 1,177 AI tools in the world right now can help in your lifestyle, everything. Your business, your study, your learning courses, your programs, your events, your designing, your rules, regulation setup, your learning courses, everything. Okay. So how we implemented it is like um, we. I started from learning by myself, and I started to build a service by using AI, and I started to sell my service by using AI. So and it works. It really works. I mean, like it's really really powerful. And uh, how many of you? do not use LinkedIn here? Or how many people use LinkedIn here? LinkedIn, I use almost LinkedIn. everyone. Okay, how many of you use LinkedIn automated system, which is not you, but your account, but using AI to run for you? How many? None. Okay, so let me tell you, my LinkedIn might reach to any one of you sitting here right now, because it's AI built, AI running, it's not me. and. My LinkedIn has reached out to more than 10,000 people in three months' time. It's my account, and I set the prompt. And my LinkedIn account will reply you, and it will find you, it will talk to you, and even it will comment on your post. So this is the AI thing. All right, everyone use email, I believe. Same thing. It works for the LinkedIn, it works for the email, it works for your Facebook, your Instagram, your WhatsApp. And it can be run by the AI. So that's why, um, okay, give you an example. JITP, we built a service called Nexus just not long ago. And we are uh, fortunate to sell six cases in less than one month. And with the word of mouth, we're not even promoting yet. So what is JITP Nexus? Which is, uh, any one of you have business, especially in tech-oriented or startup, you want to connect with investors, for example, or you want to connect with partners, we will guarantee you to talk to 300 people that you want to engage with, we will set up 10 meetings for you, guaranteed. We will translate your every of your deck in Chinese and English, everything fully. We will promote it on the social media, like WeChat, Facebook, LinkedIn, and our website and all that. And we only charge $500. And we give you the 300 people contact as well. And every day, they will be report to you, direct to your WhatsApp. So how do you feel? It's really reasonable, right? is actually the one that is doing this is AI. So what I want to say is like, AI is really changing the world and a lot of people are not utilizing them. Like for example, Big Journey and Slide AI, Beautiful AI and Magic Pen, Quillboard and many, many more. So every different AI that you can have the different functionality. So that's why uh, encoding as well, right? So I, what we can learn from here, what I think the most important we can learn from it that for the startups, for the entrepreneur, they should not think, oh, it's difficult, oh, it's difficult to do something. The AI tools can provide you a very good con concrete or skeleton or very good fundament of some information which is summarized and already like, it's like, it's like um, you don't have bread yet. But you have, or you don't have a soup yet. But you already have all the ingredients in front of you. You just now need to use a little bit of your imagination, a little bit about your resources, go, going and talking to right uh, foundations and right uh, and right people, and then start putting this together. So I think the startups and entrepreneurs have to be, in this case, very happy to use this new uh, invention as, as a fire. Yeah, and uh, I would like to ask. Uh, uh, in in intra yes or no? Uh, one question about how can we ensure that digital transformation in Indonesia inclusive all benefits or sectors of, of society? If we talk about digital transformation, 
Okay, before I answer that, can I? Yes, sir, yes. Comment on yes, yes, please, of course. Does, we are, we are, yes. Does your AI bring you money? Um, the AI sells service. In the end, the transaction has to make manually. Oh, Means okay. that people have to pay me manually, but the entire sales kit, the entire write up of the prompt, introductions, questions and answers, and the engage at the sending emails and everything is AI. So the only part I have to do is to send the invoice and give them the bank account and give the payment. They will make the payment through manually. And the agreement, everything is still AI made everything. Okay, okay. Yeah. Great, great. And can the AI be asked for to fundraise? The AI cannot do the fundraise, but the AI can help you to write the business proposal and to send out to up to 2,000, 3,000 investors by using AI and until it will reply the message until that investors want to meet you. Yeah, but in the end, you still need the person to talk with the investor in order to raise the fund, for example. Great, thank you very much. So you, uh, after this, I want you to uh, talk to my team <laughs> because they're having difficulties in fundraising. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> I spoke with IB just now as well. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Sorry. So should I repeat the question? Or? Uh, no, I have your question. I, I can repeat my the question. Yes, very good, very good, very good. Okay, how can we ensure that digital transformation in Indonesia is inclusive and benefits all sectors of society? Whoa, my notes are very long. <laughs> so, wow, A, B, C, E, F, D, E, F, G. Who oh, wrote this for you? You wrote? <laughs> Your assistant, <laughs> my my team. <laughs> you assume. Did you assume you use GPT to write this? <laughs> so they are my AI. Shorten it. Shorten they are my AI. <laughs> Shorten it. <laughs> okay. All right. First of all, first of all, inclusive technology usage or absorption starts from very early age. It starts from primary school even, or at home. So I am a big believer that anything that you do is starts from home. So inclusive means that we, we still have an issue with inclusivity. For example, for people in Indonesia, especially we have social economic status of A, B, C, D, E, right? A is the top, and then E is the, the bottom part. Now, in Indonesia, the, the, the pyramid of CDE, the last three social economic, economy status, is the largest of all. And I give you an example. The D and E, their income e is below 1 million rupiah a month and D is probably one to one and a half million rupiah a month. So if you say transformation of technology requires a device, then they will not have access to the device. So education wise, yes, it can be spread over probably in school, and at home and through TV. But if you want to use the AI tools, you need to have a, a device, right? So a device is probably not number one in their priority list, not even number two, probably number three or four. So I shared a story during the pandemic where everything has to be done through virtual, right? And the story goes like this. We were doing training to participants in the city of Trangalek in East Java. I don't know whether you know where Trangalek is, right? But we very immediately we came across a problem. One, the participant, she, uh, 
share the device with the rest of the family members. Because in the morning, the children needs to go to school and use the device. So the mom cannot use for the training that we do virtually. So what happened, normally the training is like half a day. It became three days to four days because she, the participant, can only use for one to two hours per day. And she needed to do the project, the homework, for example, that we give. It took that long for her to complete it. However, she was very eager and she completed the project, the assignments, and was able to complete the whole training. But it took from half a day to like three to four days. So this just to illustrate to you that we still have a long way for inclusive technology transformation or absorption in Indonesia because frankly speaking, the device are either not priority to them or it's still outside their household income, right? And the device is not enough without what we call the credits, the quota, right? So if they don't have that, it's not inclusive. So it's still a long way, but I believe you can do first the dissemination of the information and to gain the skills of the technology, for example, the use of AI, I only use ChatGPT out of the 1000 AI tools. And I only use it for fun. Because sometimes, sometimes when I type in into a search engine in Google, for example, I have to sort them out myself. ChatGPT helped me out for that. But one time I asked ChatGPT, who is Indra Uno? And then it created all sorts of identity. Oh, you, Indra Uno is uh, the legislative member in 2004. I was even not in working. I was in school right, at that time. So, so chat GPT uh, is not the most updated information. I'm, I'm looking forward to the bar, right? Bar Google. Yeah, bar Google. Try to register, but they say, unfortunately, only for the US and the Europe for now. Yeah. No, 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 but it's open. It's a beta. Everyone can use yeah. it. Is and it? Also, yeah, and also in ChatGPT, you have a payment version. So you buy for $20 uh, ChatGPT. Yes. Then you go to your settings. Yes. And then you press allow plugins and allow to search. Yes. Then when you start the chat in ChatGPT, on the right side, when you press ChatGPT, you press right click, and then you can use different plugins. Yes. There is oh. thousands, no, no, not it, thousands, it, but it, one. You have to teach me. Look, look, one, to hundred and hundred plugins. So for example, you have a big presentation or brochure from your partner company with 50 pages, okay? And you can just upload this presentation into this ChatGPT, and you can ask questions. Okay, summary, does it this business fits to my business and how it's can fit and how can we benefit each other, la, la, la. So you can actually uh, speed up your process of analyzing and understanding presentations, books, movies, many things. But this is also the, the things about, about um, um, to question to, uh, um, from Mr. This moment, Nalim, yes, yes. About uh, well, how do you see um, the the academy? Yes, can be more involved into yeah, can be just more, uh, the, be, can be more involved into the things with the um, okay. We just we just switch. Okay, so we have uh, one more panelist coming. Okay, just came. So uh, from the Sky Capital, yeah. 
Skystar, Skystar Capital. So can you just uh, introduce yourself and then we'll move forward uh, to the questions. Yes, sure. Thank you. So hi, everyone. My name is Jumenko Kalapasi. I am from Skystar Capital. So Skystar Capital is a venture capital that is focusing investing in technology startups. So we've been around since uh, 2014 and we are actually part of a uh, two bigger groups. One is one of the largest private equity called Saratoga Investama, which is actually owned by the brother of Pai Ono. <laughs> and the other one is uh, Compass Gramedia. So that's a bit of us. So, um, so now we everyone is here. So all the panelists are here. So we we will uh, I will do a little summary of what was going on for our audience in the online. And then uh, we will dive into this uh, problem or maybe the question about why uh, not everyone have access uh, to the devices in Indonesia and how can we maybe help to give more access to the startups or future startups to get, for example, a device. Yeah. So that was, uh, that will be the question to, to start with Nalian. Yes. What do you think? So how can we, it, it, it was a problem raised by, here. Yeah. By Indra rightly pointed out there's a, digital divide, there is a device divide, there is a network access divide, and it's there. Should everybody be happy? Yes. Should everybody have device? Yes. Will it happen? No. So let's not try to do that. I'll, I'll give a different perspective. Since we spoke about uh, Pass Andy, and he was in Mumbai yesterday ringing the bell of the National Stock Exchange, oh. the largest stock exchange in the world. And he was in Goa, our version of Bali, right? Oh. So, <laughs> so if I was a politician, and I've already said before Pahindra came that the Indonesian government is one of the most progressive governments right now in skilling talent in their own way. I speak to a lot of governments inside every citizen thinks their government can do better. But if you take a larger view between the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Tourism, Ministry of Manpower, a lot of work is being done on Industry 4.0 skilling, which has never been done before and in a positive way. But think about if I was sitting as a politician, recently I went to Canada, a developed country, right? They do not want any student to come study MBA or technology and stay back in the country. They don't want that. But if you're a truck driver, a bricklayer, a plumber, or a carpenter, red carpet for you. So as a politician, if I had to look, here is how I would look. The Global World Economic Forum Skilling Report, what does it show? The biggest demand of jobs where there's shortage in three categories. In terms of skills, the two most in-demand skills for last five years on LinkedIn, head of sales and talent recruiter. That is why I have come to this panel discussion with my head of sales and talent recruiter. One aspect. Second, in technology, biggest shortage in AI, cloud, digital marketing, those areas. But in sheer numbers, sheer numbers, the total shortage in technology is less than 1 million people. The shortage of bricklayers alone is 18 million people in the world. So as a politician, should I create bricklayers or artificial intelligence people? Who votes for me? The 18 million or 1 million? This 1 million will study here and go to another country or set up a startup, take foreign money and get out. If I was thinking like a politician, okay? That one. <laughs> true, true. That is one perspective. The other perspective, which Pahindra alluded to, who influences the young people at home? In 2045, to be a developed country with mastery over science and technology, those people who will grow the country at that time are sitting in school or college today. Who is influencing them? This young man, where did he go? He was sitting here. This young man who was sitting here studying AI was told to study AI by his mother. Not as a modern young person using Instagram, social media, realizing his mother told him to do AI. So he's studying AI. So who influences the young minds? who are going to make our country great. Teachers, the leader of the household, yeah, right? yeah. teachers, leaders of the household, etc. We need to focus our attention on educating them as much as we focus on 
educating teachers. One last data point, which is a very big positive for Indonesia. The Coursera Global Skilling Report shows that the number of students from Indonesia who took up STEM courses in 2022 versus 2021 grew by 51 percent the largest single jump in the year and the percentage of women in that was 34 percent higher than europe and america these are the positives that are happening which we don't notice because like a great philosopher said life is lived forward but understood backwards 10 years later when you look back you will be looking at these politicians and saying wow what a great job they did today we are cursing them right that's how life goes. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very, very, very good. Uh, I actually would like to touch um, uh, touch Raffle a little bit uh, about uh, how do you also see uh, and how do you look for a talented people, for example? Or do you, did you ever have experiences like you need to find talent person or when you uh, have a project or you have the idea and you want to uh, show this idea to somebody else, but for example, you don't have time for it. Did you ever been have this experience? Yeah. So coming back to your question, right? so basically, I have um, some employees, but most of my employees are part timer. They have a main job, then they have a second job. Second job, which is my job. So I pay them hourly. Every day they work only two hours minimum, maximum three hours, but they have the basic task. Whatever that we provide for them, basically how to use AI to work for him and for the company or her for the company, all right? Your clock in time, it can be flexible. And as long as you clock in and you upload your work task workforce on the Google Drive. So I know because we have the access of all the emails and everything. And we use utilize Crunchbase for the data. Crunchbase is one of the biggest um, startup data. They have 300,000 startups inside. So every day they must have the 100 emails sent out before that, before they implement by using AI. But right now we are using yeah, AI, AI fully. So, so what they have to do is just like for the, um, finding more partners to help them to implement our program or promote our program. For example, someone like Innotech. Yeah, find, finding people like Innotech from all around the world and speak with them. So basically your job is AI helps you to find Innotech and you just speak with them about the program, okay? But coming back to the part in the question just now, it reflected about a story in China. I mean, uh, for the past eight years, I based in China. I'm not sure if anyone know, 1994, China started their China net. At that time, a lot of Chinese people, they had no phone, no TV, no internet, nothing. But the China government implemented China, China, China net. And in 20 years, in 2014, internet users from zero, to 1.4 billion in 2014. They implemented 5G, 4G, and everything, starting from the infrastructures of the government. So they skipped the era. They have no TV at all, but they built their own smartphone. Starting from before, um, before the iPhone came out, they already are using PDA, right? Pocket Digital uh, Assistant. PDA already, like, they know that the, they will be overcoming. The smartphone will be overcoming, taking over the computer, taking over the laptop and everything before Apple announced iPhone. So coming back to this is like, they learn, they copy how to make a phone, how to make a touchscreen phone, how to make a phone that you can install the system inside. They don't know how to make the chipset. They acquire the chipset. They buy the chipset. They learn how to build it. And they build the cheapest phone in the world. And I'm not sure if anyone knows, 15 years ago, China phone is crazily sending out, selling the whole world. Some are usable, some are not usable. Some like fake iPhone, fake Samsung, fake everything. But now no more. Why? It's an era. It's a transparency. So it's a tr uh, like transformation, revolutions. So people who have no internet payment, using cash only, no, in no bank account, no internet, until they now, everyone, basically everyone in China, 1.4 billion people has a smartphone. Why? The smartphone is as cheap as a dish or something like really, like a food, a meal, like 100 yuan or 200 yuan. You can buy a phone, you can accessible to internet. And if you cannot afford the phone, never mind. The government gives you the installment to pay 12 months of 200 yuan, which is equivalent to 400,000 rupiah. You can pay in 12 months time. Okay, so this is how the government implemented and the government foresee from the, 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 the looping, the jumping from the era to era. 
So completely overcoming it. Okay, of course, rich people, they can afford that, but poor people, they cannot, but it's okay. Now, the China government is also implementing their own AI system. They banned ChatGPT, they banned Bar Google, they banned in China for the past eight years' time. I'm a foreigner and, I'm, I'm, and I know English. So I'm like kind of blessed that I can access into the world and everything by using VPN. But imagine that until today, 95% of Chinese people don't know English. But how developed and how strong they are, because they are building their own technology, own system, own infrastructures and everything through the governments. And they still having the, the gap. And that's why GIT comes in. That's why the government will uh, assign us the procurement rather than uh, giving to the Chinese people. But what am I doing for the China government? We are acquiring it and doing the talent acquisitions from all around the world, inviting them into China. It's just like what you said. We are bringing the talent into China. The government giving, okay, for example, any one of you who has master degree, regardless your master is engineering, or agricultural or psychology or whatever thing, we have the program to support. If you land in China, the government will give you 500,000 yuan to 1 million yuan into your company account who you set up in China. So these are the things, how it works starting from the fundamental model, infrastructures, changing everything uh, by the level by the level. Like it, it, it takes time, yeah. Well, thank you very much. I think we have to look into those cases and learn from other countries, successful cases and implement them. Well, I have some questions to Mr. Yuvenko, correct? Yes. Uh, about, can you tell us a little bit more about how you actually working with the startups and how do you help them or you, or do you, oh, because, you know, those chat GPT and AI just came to the market as like becoming a mass market. Do, how do you start adopting your investments or your, uh, how do you look for the startups with those technology? Sorry, can you repeat the last question? Uh, so, how do you, uh, because of ChatGPT came as a mass market, yes? So, maybe can you please tell us a little bit more about how do you work? Yes. And how do you work maybe now when those technology actually appears in the market like this, as it is now? And uh, also, with these things around, uh, how do you uh, look for the startups or uh, do funding uh, by using those technology? understand. So uh, thanks for the question. So usually how we work with the startup is we pretty much like, other than the capital that we invested, we would usually do consulting model way in terms of like understanding what business model that works in other comparable markets and try to find a way to localize it in Indonesia. Because Indonesia, uh, if you guys understand, I mean, like Indonesia is an archipelagic country and maybe we are one of the largest economy in the world that is archipelagic. So a lot of like the business models that work in other comparable markets may not work in Indonesia. So that's where we came in. That's how we would help startup because usually all the startup founders usually are uh, overseas, overseas graduates, graduates and, and this is their this first, is their first time, time building, building, building a business. business. So, so that's, that's where, where we came in. And, uh, Thankfully, that a lot of our investment team has a decade of experience in working with Indonesian, uh, you know, companies. That's how we kind of like leverage that bridge and connections for the new uh, startups. And in terms of like the the new AI technology is actually it's new to everybody. So the what we have seen in the market at the moment in Indonesia is that a lot of startups actually use uh, chat GPT technology and also other open AI, sorry, oh yeah, other open AI, um, you know, their, I would say their technology is more on the customer service. So customer service actually help a lot in terms of like screening, uh, pre-select what sort of like customers should go into which channel of the departments that actually help a lot and saves time and to give you a context it can actually like save at least 60 percent of the labor uh, power uh, when a startup decided to implement like customer service into chat uh, with, with the chat gpt technology and for magic capital we actually it also saves a lot of time for us as a lot of um, when when it comes to google we do our own research like public market research. Uh, so ChatGPT, unfortunately, it's only limited to 
you know, 2021 data. So now there's actually BART. So we're actually actively using BART because it's connected to the internet with the latest update. So when we do research in terms of a comparable models in other markets, understanding what's happening in other markets, because, you know, we are not, we are blessed in a way that Indonesia is maybe like, I would say like five to 10 years uh, away compared to like China or India startup market. So um, we Indonesia can learn from other comparable markets. And with this chat GPT, sorry, BART, it's actually speed up the process in terms of learning, uh, you know, the, the mature startups in those regions. And that actually gives us a better context when we try to invest and also source for the right sectors and deals. Uh, that's pretty much how it helps. Interesting. Um, it's, um, it's good, it's good. But I was just listening and I just had an idea, like I can see that so many things are involved around not only people, of course people, but it's also, it's also it's all about people, but people who is actually in the government. But maybe if we can look into the startup as a government, as a government, for example, how can you help government being as a startup at the moment? Because it's something new happening. Are you able to help as government with your uh, knowledge or you, did you ever had those kind of um, experiences working with the government to, to, to help them with your knowledge? You usually help startups, but they also start up. What do you think that. about this idea? So I think what, um, maybe to give a, a bit of context, I'm actually an ex-founder. So I happened to build one of the largest wealth tech uh, startup called Bibit. Uh, maybe some of the Indonesian friends would know Bibit. So it's a, it's a wealth tech platform focusing in mutual funds. So I was the original founder. I exited in 2019. So not just as a venture capital perspective, even as a startup, we actually some sort of like because tech is actually a new play for the governments. And, uh, you know, regulations usually can't really keep up with what's happening in a technology advancement. So uh, during my time, if you guys are familiar with the mutual fund market, when an investor, a retail investor wants to invest in a mutual fund product, it has to go through a custodian bank. So it couldn't go through directly uh, on, the, on the app. So the app cannot hold any funds. But that actually creates a lot of frictions for a startup. Because we oh, there are maybe like 40 custodian banks in Indonesia. And we in order to connect one by one, it just takes a lot of time and energy. And on the other hand, the retail investor they wouldn't know after they wired the money, they wouldn't know whether it has wired successfully. So there's an information gap on that part. And millennials, we like instantaneous things, right? So uh, we are actually the first startup, Bibi was, sorry, Bibi was the first startup to actually convince the government that we can actually hold the money for a bit, just for a while, less than 30 minutes, just to give an assurance for the retail, for the users, that the we have received the funds and it will be proceeded to the custodian bank, and that's actually not regulated at that point of time. But because of you know the technology advance, advancement, government starts to re-regulate you know uh, the regulations OJK to be exact, right? So, and in terms of like that is from the startup side and from the venture capital side, actually. Governments have been talking to us like what's the trends in the technology space. And let's say crypto is also something that is like interesting to the government. Uh, we educate in terms of like how blockchain works, but on a high level, high level surface. Then we would connect them to all these operators in the market. Let's say Reckoning Cook, Indodax, you know, all these exchanges and have them to actually, because the governments wouldn't know who are the players. So the venture capital stays closer with the players. So, and then they would kind of like re-regulate uh, with the operators. So I would say we help uh, indirectly, but how governments regulate their regulations, usually they would work with the industry players rather than the venture capital. 
Thank you. Right. So it seems like Indonesian government can uh, can react quite fast in the in terms of the things. Do how about uh, you? Do, do you have some also experiences with the government cases where you? So let some... me tell you our story, and we have received great support from Pa Sandy in our story. You know, my co-founders Pa Sachin and Pa Ilham Habibi. We are a Habibi company. Do you know of any global ranking list? where an Indi Indonesian education institute comes in the top 10. Our top university is 343, Ipe Bay. Do you know any global ranking list where an Indonesian education institute is ranked in the top 10? Forbes magazine, Economic Times, and most recently Business Burg from USA ranked Orbit Future Academy number one in the world as a private academy. We have trained 30,000 Indonesian college students on AI and cloud. We have placed thousands of people into jobs. We, have, we are currently training 3.3 million school teachers and skilling them up for digital teaching. We are skilling 100,000 business owners across ASEAN. All these contracts are by the government large scale social change can come only through the government. Private sector is not interested in training, they're interested in profit. Not only private sector, we are a company without any VC funding, without any institutional funding, profitable from day one. Because VCs don't like B2G model. They love the government, but they don't trust the government. When founders go to them, I'm glad he has been a founder. And I have written my, one of my eight books, which is a bestseller, it's called Get Funded Now. And I have got 300 companies funded across the globe. They will tell founders, oh, 90% startups fail. I look at VCs and ask them, you with your Harvard, MIT, and Wharton degrees still have a 50% failure rate. How come you can't get at least 80% right? It is fashionable. These things are fashionable. We are a slice of society, English speaking, technology savvy, sitting here and discussing AI. But like pa Indra said, large parts need a mindset shift. We can't wait for that. But the greatest regulation, movement, positive direction is coming from the government. And when I speak to multiple governments across the world, believe me, Indonesian government is one of the most progressive. I cannot think of running a business like this, even in my home country of India not possible, they are closed. We have an open government that speaks to industry, partners with private players like us. It doesn't happen anywhere else. Well, that sounds really good, brilliant. Um, I also a big believer that uh, most of the things or ma ma main of the things must come from the politician games to, the, to, to get adoption of new technology. And those, because economy, it's one thing, it's very logical. Economy works as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a watch, you know, but politicians work, working is a different, it's, it's a game, it's a different thing, you know, it's more emotions, it's more about, you know, being human in a way. So uh, do you have some also things you want to maybe add uh, to the working, uh, to the, with politician, with the government, maybe you have some experiences and also, if there was a perfect world, how do you see connections between, for example, you know that foundation, academy, PC funds, and government? Maybe if you if you will want to go there, you can jump a little bit. Mm -hmm. How much time do you have? Uh, uh, how much time do you have? You can have one minute, two minutes, or three minutes. Okay. <laughs> or you can combine them also. Because yeah. uh, the reason I ask because it can take very long. Because your question is very comprehensive. But we try to be short with okay. our ChatGPT. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll try. I'll give you an example. About six years, seven years ago, in 2016, me and my brother, who happens to be a politician, he and I started a social movement. And a social movement is in income creation through entrepreneurship. So what we do is like Pak Nalin, we do training 
to a lot of people through volunteering. And we provide the curriculum, the syllabus, and then we train the trainer. The volunteer trained the trainer. In the first year, we were able to train around 40,000 micro, 40,000 in the first year. That is just through volunteering, just the community's initiatives. In 2017, one year later, we work with Jakarta government. They agreed to apply what we did in Jakarta. So they put more budget in. And in one year, they were able to triple the 40,000 because simply because they have the budget. And the budget only comes when they set a policy. Peraturan Gubernur. Right? Governor regulation. So they were able to do that and then allocate the budget. And in four years, they were able to do about eight to nine times to 300,000 people in Jakarta to receive the training, the mentoring and coaching, and then access to permits, access to larger markets, access to better bookkeeping, and most importantly, at the end, access to the local bank, the regional bank. So they were able to provide their certificate of attendance to the bank and be given loan, say for 5 million or 10 million without any collateral. So just buy that certificate. So that's how the government can facilitate growth of, for example, income creation. And in this case, it's technology innovation. But the danger, like Nalin said, they made it into their own program, which means that they run like a bureaucrats like a politician, they should work together with the private sectors and communities and let the private sectors and communities do it while they facilitate with policies, regulation, and the budget. Not overtaking the program into their own. Otherwise, when it becomes their program, it just it will run by bureaucrats. So that's the danger. Uh, I, I see you. I see your point. Okay, now we're looking into the case. If we will in, 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 invite, 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 invite knowledge, to, knowledge the, to the country, uh, country and, we and we will do digitalization of Indonesia. Indonesia. And uh, Indonesia, step by step, will become as a smart city. That also means it will give some benefits and maybe some minus and some plus, you know. So I see there is the one of the main benefits that will come like is less bureaucracy, you know, uh, maybe um, uh, most uh, fastest way for a person or citizen to access different services. Because at the moment, if you look into digitalizations, I'm from uh, from Latvia and uh, have, uh, our friends are uh, Estonia. And if you look in Estonia, it's completely digitalized. You know, everything digitalized. But when I look in Estonia now as a digitalized country, I, uh, I can see there is so many services. It's like opening iPhone with 1 million settings, you know? So I think that you, you, even Indonesia now start thinking quite a lot about digitalization. You know, of course, it's about startups bringing to the government and saying, this is a good startup because they know what, what to do. Um, I think uh, uh, government must to be like really open and give and use those uh, technology, but also simplify. Because what you, when, when you look into the cases of Estonia, it's not simplified. You have to like really know your iPhone or really know your Samsung with all the settings how it works, you know? So, um, so this communication between, I think there is also like a gap between like communication between citizen, government, business, you know? 
must be more like interconnected. And I hope with the, with the technology, it can uh, it can involve. What do you think? About this? So I will just add to that. You made a very good point that you know uh, Indonesia is one of the largest archipelago economies of the world, and our problems are unique. Something that works in say in Estonia, whose population may be, come on. Uh, one or two million, I think. Come on. Two to three million. <laughs> like a file, you know? Yeah, from, from, from the country I come, that, that many people we miss counting every year. <laughs> more than that. Yeah, more, more than that. We just overtook China as the most populous country in the world. Oh, that's nothing to be proud of. <laughs> but to your point, I find it amusing that we expect our politicians to have 20 and 50 year visions with a five year mandate. All of us work in companies, right? I'm CEO of Orbit Future Academy. If I ask the 200 employees that here are three candidates for CEO, will they choose me? Will you be chosen for your role if people had to vote for you? And if people voted you for you and put you in that position, would you take the decisions you take every day or would you take different decisions? Think about that. It's very easy to say they should do this, they should do that, etc. But if you are, if you were an elected person, even in your office, in your house, will your wife or husband vote you to be the leader of the house among two of you? <laughs> I know the answer in my house. <laughs> it's not me. So when you put that in perspective, then you understand, you know, the, the, this the partnerships, whatever we see are so difficult to put together. Your point is right. There are so many countries which are a lab experiment of what can be Singapore, Estonia. These are lab experiments. Small corner of locality of Kamang or Bangalore, we, we can cover that whole population. These are lab experiments of what a country can be, what a tempered autocracy could be. But to apply it across a diverse country like this, very, very difficult, very difficult. And take everybody along and get voted back to power five years from now. It's almost impossible. Somebody or the other will come up and object. Okay, cool, cool, nice. Um, I can say that, um... I think we need to move a little bit more further, uh, maybe more further up, you know, and looking from the uh, even higher scale. Because if we look into the case that we already have a lot of cases, like for example, I heard not even once China and the, how, they, how great they are at the moment, but you know, now they have problems, now they're going through the crisis. But what actually they did, they did something very smart. So what they did, they, they, they really understand how the economic works. So what they did is they checked dollars to the economic system because we're living in the dollar uh, world. So they checked dollar and then they subsidized uh, uh, people like the startups who want to do some manufacturing. Yeah. How they, How they, 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 just, they just uh, said, okay, said, okay you, you, it's very, it's easy, very to easy to get long, but because, but the, because country the country is digitalized. digitalized, it's so easy to control everything, you know? So. And the, the, the money can be stolen from the, the entrepreneurs. He cannot steal the money. So they, you know, they give this money. So he buying the manufacturing, for example, the something to manufacture. And then now he have one manufacturer, he have employees and have, he have a building. So now he wants to export his goods. The country, the China, they give him 10% or they cover 10% of all the export costs, you know? So, so, and, and in this case, that's how China grow up so fast, you know? But now uh, things are changing. The China will go into a little crisis, America go into the crisis, Europe going less manufacturing, Russia have problem with the economy because they, know they need to have more investment, you know, to grow. But now you have Indonesia and Asian region, which I think they will be the next big things where all those three countries will not like fight for it, but they want to work with it. A lot. And I think countries like Indonesia and uh, Malaysia, they really need to be aware of this and really fast, from my perspective, gauge those technology from other uh, countries, gauge the strategy, how they grow so fast and really adapt to those, uh, to, to the country. 
and um, and uh, of course it's uh, so much uh, connected to the companies like uh, like your your foundation and uh, academy and uh, venture funds and entrepreneurs that it must get driven but it's driving again by the talents how so how can we get more talents more talents some of it i spoke about before pindra came right first stop people from going out stop these it companies from offshoring stuff stop them from bringing foreign talent for low end jobs not really needed what have the pandemic taught us when the pandemic hit we shut our street from our neighbor within the same country we couldn't go from one province to the other where is the question of cooperating with another country the pandemic taught us only we can help ourselves all supply chain should be local everything should be close country matters most the rest is all talk when push comes to shove when it comes to existence we don't even look at neighbor having these higher lofty goals are good and sometimes when i speak like this i think i should be a politician <laughs> no <laughs> when i was a kid in school i used to boast to my friends one day i will make movies i will write books and i will fight elections i made 14 movies and went bankrupt i have written eight books thankfully i was a successful entrepreneur so i became unbankrupt but elections i didn't fight but sometimes when i speak like this i think i should fight elections also <laughs> so pandemic taught us that right things have to be local the talent has to be local people cannot take the government's subsidies study ai at their cost and go work overseas we should put a program for them to all compulsorily come back here contribute here many of them want to many, many of them do it voluntarily like i mentioned before you came most of the funded startups are by people who studied overseas not people who studied here and most of the successful startups are owned by foreign companies not indonesian anymore there are lessons in all that last point about lesson in indonesia we did not open up the e-commerce sector to foreign players like the gentleman who was sitting on this chair the company he came from india made that mistake what happened our version of tokopedia which is called flipkart is virtually wiped out it was a decacon today nobody goes to it everything is on amazon so tech doesn't mean an open door for people to come in take our data take our markets etc sure. and, and not, not contribute, contribute back and corporates by nature are not about giving back they are about taking if you looked at the latest layoffs by the largest tech companies of the world their free cash flow is enough to pay not just the people they laid off their full staff for the next 80 years on an average 8080 yet the greed that they laid off thousands of people and put off thousands of families and made, many had to leave countries though that is corporation that is capitalism you can't expect charity from them it is only the government that can make the change through its policies and the people we elect thank you so much thank you uh, this is this is right did you ever have experience mr um, sorry to okay, my juvenco juvenco yes all the jps but he's okay. <laughs> okay do you have any experience like the colonel person came to indonesia then for example the colonel person get involved into the indonesian startup and you invest in it or something similar cases or do you see there is there is maybe more criminals coming to indonesia to do some business or doing startups and so uh we do actually back uh you know foreign founders so we are a venture capital at heart so we're capitalists sorry <laughs> venture <laughs> so, capital <laughs> venture capital yeah so we but we definitely you know would consider the foreign founder background like whether he knows the market we will definitely challenge him in terms of like the sector he's trying to uh tackle um and we usually would be more comfortable to back founders that partner with local founders so he can be a foreign uh, founders but what gives us more comfort is that if he has a local partners Uh, so in maneuvering you know steering and also navigating and uh you know when trying to close a deal with other vendors 
if you're having a local face actually really helps because I think it goes the same to most, I would say most businesses when a foreign, uh, a foreign counterpart comes in, usually it takes time for us to understand both culture because to form a partnership with a clashing cultures, usually it's considered risky, right? So yeah, to, in, in, a, in a nutshell, we do back. We do back foreign founders. Okay, that's, uh, that's uh, I think it's a good move. I think it's interesting and also can be interesting uh, how uh, like a government can also help and sponsor these things to, to attract more foreigners. And, uh, and, and to keep actually the startup here as a local Indonesian or local Asian startup. Something like that. It's going to be interesting to, to see how it can get involved. Maybe adding one point, right? So if a foreign founder came, usually they are experienced because they have been working in, you know, multinational companies before. And when they came to Indonesia, usually that's kind of the sector they want to target because working in a multinational uh, company, let's say insurance. So we backed one Chinese founder, uh, you know, uh, that used to work in a Tencent company, uh, but focusing in insurance. So he actually sees there's a gap in the Indonesia market. And because of that knowledge, feels that he's maybe already MBA, while well, the local founders that we've met and we've screened across the market, maybe it's just key in the garden. So that's kind of like to put like the knowledge gap there. So that's why. Yeah. So that that means that the foreign companies who already got success, or they are like ex employees from the successful companies in different markets, often coming to Indonesia and try to also get involved in them get get success. So, yeah, 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 yeah. And that's something you're looking for. But you're trying to combine with Indonesian people. So Indonesian can also learn from the foreigners. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, okay, Mr. Apple. Uh, do you want to add a few things? Yeah, uh, about uh, about the technology. Yeah, about the talent question. Actually, yeah, talent. it's also reflected another two scenario. I make it short. I make it short. So Singapore, they used to be very behind in terms of biotechnology, in but in twenty, I think it's in year two thousand, they started their called Biopolis Initiative. So what do the Singaporean government do? They foresee that in the twenty twenty years time biotechnology will be a major impact for a small country like Singapore. And hence that they started this biopolis. They pay five times more to hire all the top talent from MIT, Howard, like Cambridge, Oxford into Singapore, just to teach and educate the lecturer in Singapore and those PhD holders in Singapore to train them become bio, uh, biotech uh, experts, okay? Meanwhile, they form ASTAR, ASTAR is working together with the government funding and also the enterprises, the corporates to acquire the talents from the biotech to develop their R&D and give them funding. And right now, in I think if I'm not mistaken, like recent years, 2020 or 2022, Singapore has been ranked top five biotechnology country in the world. So what do you see that? You see that which is every single uh, university in, uh, in Singapore has been implemented the very strong fundamental like knowledge about biotechnology. So whatever you build, you build biotechnology. Okay, coming back to another story. How do you adapt the learning from country to country? Okay, um, um, Singapore, I'm going to Singapore on Sunday because I've been invited by the Guangdong government China to Singapore because they have a conference there. And what happened is, I'm not sure if anyone knows, Guangdong, Guangzhou. How many of you have been to Guangzhou? Okay, not many. Let me tell you, Guangzhou is the biggest trade city in China and also in the world. And in one of the districts in Guangzhou is actually owned by Singapore government and China government. It's called Sino Singapore. It's a small uh, duplicate Singapore in Guangzhou. Okay? So what happened is 50% of the population will be from Singapore and 50% of the population from Guangdong. Okay? So it's a very funny thing. And they brought the talent into China, because Singapore is very limited access. For example, Singapore land is so expensive, the house is so expensive, the HDB is not enough, like some of the lower tier people, they cannot survive there. What do they do? They work with the government of China to build another Singapore in China. And what happened is, the government only allowed Singaporean to be there for the long term, and they access and with a high support. For example, if you want a Singaporean startup, you go there, it's basically free rent, free apartment, 
and free uh, services, facilities, and everything, free tax, because this is a between the initiative between the Singapore government and Guangdong government in Guangzhou. So this is one of the good example. And the talent will move in, and they build a city in a city, and build a community. And the education, the school is 50% owned by the Singaporean, everything. Basically everything, infrastructures, building, planning, everything is between Singapore government and the Guangdong government. Yeah, so this is one of the example, right? And another thing, I just recently been to Iran and just came back. Iran has been sanctioned by the US and their currency dropped 50 times, 50 times because of the sanction. Just one day, I've been visited to so many factory, Siemens and like, uh, like Coca-Cola, LG and all that thing. Like basically Samsung, all this, Company moved out in one week time, closed down completely. So it affected like, like I think more than five hundred thousands of jobs yeah, because of the sanction. And the currency dropped oh, wow. by fifty no, times. Imagine no. it suddenly dropped fifty no. times in one day. So the people are struggling. And guess what? The government of Iran they use only like less than twenty years time to build everything by themselves. They build their plant, they plant their food, they export their goods, and everything still sanctioned. Starting from that, I was so shocked. One hundred fifty dollars U.S. dollars, you can have an okay living in oh, yeah. Iran. Okay living means you can afford for your children, you can afford for your wife, you can afford to live, and everything is okay. You don't have to work overtime. You work five days per week. That's all. Only one hundred fifty dollars. Why? Because things are ridiculously cheap. Imagine I was at the five stars hotel. I'm having the one of the best about the most expensive hotel in Iran. Okay, sponsored by the government. Thank you. <laughs> so the steak, the kebab steak set is this big. The most expensive, yeah, is only seven point five dollars. Yeah, can you imagine that? And guess what? So another thing from technology wise, they started to implement nanotechnology in any field. Any field, subsidize, subsidize, subsidize. If you file a patent about nanotechnology, free. If you study for nanotechnology, free. And guess what? The whole Iran study system from kindergarten all the way to PhD are free. Everyone is master and PhD there. Everyone. So basically, she went there. Oh, you are the doctor, you are the doctor, you are the doctor. And like so many doctors. The most doctors, PhD holders that have been visited is in Iran. And guess what? Right now, they are the top four, top five nanotechnology in the world, all thanks to the sanction. And all thanks to the sanction, they build everything by themselves. Things are ridiculously cheap. And yeah, so, so this is how it works. Starting from the government, implementation is really important. And the talent. That's why they secure the talent. And a lot of people move back. They are making $35,000 per month. And he moved back. He's the lecturer. He moved back to Iran, Tehran, and he became a lecturer, and his pay is only $4,000. It's like nine times lower. But he told me that, Raffles, in US, $35,000, I might not save $3,000. But in here, $4,000, I can save $3,000, and yet I can live with my wife and my children. Yeah, so, so, so. $4,000 and $35,000. He chose $4,000. He went back to his country to develop again. I really think we can see here uh, when the, the nation gets in the hunger stage, things are start moving. That's also, we see this in the history in Germany, and that's what we see now, uh, like in Europe before, it was very movement, big movement. They start building, building, building. And uh, that's what we see in Iran now. They're doing the same uh, thing. They try to uh, survive. Uh, and actually about three things, what can I add, that uh, person have to pay something to get knowledge. If there is a free knowledge, it's a lot of uh, crazy questions. I mean, you know, you need to have some kind of respect to the knowledge. So you give something and you give, get something back. Yeah. And um, like how do you feel, guys? You will continue for a little bit more or you get to try? Open, open for you. Or huh? Questions from the audience? Maybe? We can do the questions from the audience. Yes. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask you a personal question. I mean, uh, all this time I hear everything is positive in terms of the country's uh, development and all that. But we also need to remember that next year is a political year. Is it going to be the same like previous time in the election? 
the challenges, the the obstacles, or is it going to be just another election days and everything is going to be hoi hoi again? Thank you. Okay. I'm looking from the lens of economic opportunities, right? And then I'll comment a little bit more on how it that is supported by events or big events such as the election. The election will happen on the 14th of February, 2024. Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. And mind you, if, if there are three candidates, so that will be the first election. You mean the presidential? Yes, presidential election in 2024. So, which means that from three to two, right? If there are three, but if there's only two, that's the only presidential election that we will have. Now, from economic point of view, from the government side, having one election is very costly, right? So you can use the funds to do other better things, right? To develop the nation. Now, but from players such as companies or communities or people, the more events you have, the more opportunity you have to sell something, to provide something for transaction wise. So there are two point of view there. And Indonesia's election in 2019, I don't know, the figure is about 25 trillion rupiah. 25 trillion rupiah. Just one election, right, in 2019. 2019, so we don't have more than two candidates, just one candidate. But what happened in 2019, the campaign time, the period is 252 days. Now, for 2024, the campaign period is 70 days. So, government learned their lesson, 252 days cost a lot. They want to reduce from 25 trillion to somewhere like a third of it, maybe. And hopefully, there are only two candidates, right? If there are three, there will be more. Now, I'm not going to predict that it's going to be in like 2019, but we are, the society are, are sl smarter now in terms of election. But I agree that we have a long way to go for our election to become inclusive. Why? Because right now, just like companies, companies when they acquire customer, there is an acquisition cost, right? In election, one vote acquisition cost, for example, is between 50,000 to 100,000 per person. 50,000 rupiah to 100,000 per person. Imagine to win an election, you need around 70 to 80 million votes. Multiply that to 100,000. What is that? A lot. Eight, zero, A lot. Eight, 800 million, eight trillion. Trillions. Billions. Eight trillion rupiah. So when you are a candidate, you need to fundraise at least 8 trillion rupiah to be able to win. Right? Which is the cost, the main cost? The main cost, where the money goes, I want you to know. For example. Because what about if we add some technology with like e-voting, blockchain, you know? You know? 
Save some money, you know? In 2019, they already started that. AI election. Yes. That was their, their, their move. Well, next election, we will do this way. But this election, let's make some money, yeah? If you put it that way, you have an opportunity. Just say, Indonesian people, would you rather your government spend 10 trillion for the election or spend 5 trillion and the other 5 trillion is developed for technology? Use the technology so that we can use it for subsequent elections, right? For 2029 or even for the legislative in 2024, but in November, right? That will save a lot of money because the money used for the presidential election, half of it you can use for technology innovation in election. Why am I saying the acquisition cost? Because everything needs, you know, to create the, the banner, to create TV ads, and to have all those volunteers. That takes money. I give you an illustration. On the day of 14 of February, where the election is, there will be around 800,000 polling booths. 800,000 polling booths. Each participant or candidate will need minimum two witnesses. So they have to pay for that. Two witnesses one day, for example, cost one million, right? One million, just for the food and for their time. 800,000 times one million. How much is that? Uh, trillions. <laughs> no, 800 billion rupiah, one day. Almost one trillion. Just one day. Yeah, 800 billion rupiah one day. So you can imagine if you have 8 trillion, which is 10 times more, spent over 70 days will be used for TV commercial, maybe not even 1 trillion TV commercial. So TV commercial, you, you know, uh, 30 seconds cost 100 million rupiah, right? So the bulk of the money will go to the execution, the buying, the expenses. The expenses for people going left and right, providing food, providing events. 70 days, you will have not 70 events. You will have times, how many provinces in Indonesia? 34, right? How many region, Kabupaten? 434 kabupaten. So every kabupaten, every region, every province have minimum one event a day per candidate. Per candidate. So if you have two candidates, you have two. So the reason I'm explaining this is that you can see the economic impact of such election event, right? And either technology can be part of that and save a lot of money and you develop R&D in and then be used for 2024 legislative, 2024 election for the head of the region, the governor, not only the president, you can have a lot of impact. So I don't know whether that answers yeah. you. Um, so to be short, how do you see the future after the election? Is it going to be the same euphoria that we just talked about? Okay. Economic impact, I think all of us would like to have stability in terms of activities, economic activities. Unfortunately, learning from 2019 and before, many of corporations takes the wait and see approach. So they don't invest more. 
So, which means that this is the uh, the joke at the, in the office, in Saratoga office. Okay, starting from November, we take a long vacation until February. If we don't do anything, the company is still there, but we take long vacation. So, which means that we are expecting a positive outcome out of that, but leading to February, we will have a wait and see approach, right? Because we, we don't wanna like over invest. We probably do some R&D and then internal looking for our internal development. Other than that, we, we don't do any new investment or riskier investment. So having seen a lot of elections, you know, nothing changes dramatically good or bad. Life will go on, go on well. People who get elected will do good for the country. One degree less here, one degree more there. Things will progress well. If you look at the larger picture, Indonesia is resilient, growing, trade balance surplus, unlikely to have a recession like other countries, all good. But we all like to have the best. For example, my personal thing, I love God and I want to live in heaven, but for that I have to die. What is the price you're willing to pay for making heaven here? So I'm unwilling to pay that price. For what we are spending, we will get what we spent for. And more or less, it will be the same. I don't see anything hugely negative or positive. It will continue. And whoever takes power is 15 to 18 months away. There's a whole life to be led till there. And as a corporate CEO, I focus on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Makasi, Paidra. Say Ismail dari Orbit. Okay. Do you want to add something to the yeah, question? I, I want to tell a little bit yeah, yeah. about the experience. Sorry, sorry, I want to say a little bit. He has no experience of elections. China doesn't have elections. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm from Malaysia. So recently we just changed a new government, right? Not long ago. Yeah, Anwar, Anwar, the latest one. So let me tell you, there is a tsunami wave. No one expected. We call it the green tsunami, which is the Bumi's one, most of the seats, 79 seats, okay? They never win that much in the entire Malaysia history. They are the opposition right now. So what happened is, how do they win? The statistics show out. Guess what helps them to win? TikTok. They make more than 2,200 extremist video. Okay. And 900 has been removed. 1,300 was still there. So basically, TikTok. And they use TikTok and they spent 5.8 million US dollars to one 79 seats, which is so cheap comparing to normal normal people. Why? Because this is the first time Malaysia implemented 18 years old, first time voter, and everyone watched TikTok. So when you just commercial ads, 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 and TikTok makes so much money just for the one election. This is just from the Rumi's and the, the uh, PM, yeah? And another side also. So eventually, who make money? TikTok make money. And guess what? They are the technology company. Yeah, and TikTok owned by China. Yes. You know, and the position is more, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. so, so I just want to tell you guys. Yes. yes. Technology, technology this is good. 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 Technology, 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 could technology could change a lot of things, including, including elections. Yeah. Hence, TikTok, TikTok is banned in India. <laughs> Completely banned. You 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 cool. Okay, okay. So, guys, uh, what we, how about we, we can try to do some summary? You know, so if each of us will do some summary, what he, you know, here, you know, and uh, I think this summary can be, can be maybe valuable. We can, I can create a small report later on and we can decide to whom it's going to be sent as making more um, informative things. Also, maybe give some ideas for the entrepreneurs, startups, also for, uh, for the government to, to move for, to move forward and use things like election, you know, times, to actually add something more valuable to the society. So, yeah. But uh, maybe you start with some summary. Send with Thanks for that. So I think as uh, businesses, three key things uh, to kind of like ride along the technology wave. So I'm speaking as a local Indonesian here. I know a lot of like businesses in Indonesia 
is still in its infancy stage in terms of implementing just the infrastructure of the technology. So I would highly encourage businesses to be receptive and you know just the typical you know moving data to a to a cloud base rather than on premise having a good internet connection that's actually still a challenge in Indonesia so that's one so be receptive to technology second is once you adopt technology you should be data driven so data driven that's when the ai and the ml which is a machine learning kicks in because without data AI just doesn't work locally in your businesses. So you have to have, you have to capture data and then uh, be data driven. And third is definitely be innovative because Indonesia is usually very secretive about their own data. But we are actually in a world where partnership is something that is very common expressed especially when you are adopting uh, digitally, you want to digitize your business. So actually working with other startups, so-called, let's say AWS, right? AWS has a lot of like cloud native technology, uh, even that they have like, even like for a fintech company, you don't have to build your own MPL, uh, you know, credit scoring. AWS has actually provided that. You just like tweak in terms of like how you want to customize it and you will, you know, sort of like decrease your NPL significantly. So three things, right? So uh, upgrade your digital infrastructure, be data driven, and always be innovative. That's the truth. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think I just really like the key values we already mentioned also. I'm just afraid like Pai and maybe have nothing to mention anymore later on because he's like keep on repeating the same thing. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anyway, so for myself, uh, I every day I spend 10 to 15 minutes learning new AI tools and I want to see how AI could keep changing my lifestyle, my business, people surrounding me, everything by using AI. So every day I've been dedicated 10 to 15 minutes just to learn about new AI tools, new AI tools. Because why? You don't need to build a chat GPT there. There's already there. You don't need to build a thousand and a hundred and seventy-seven AI tools in the world that are already there. So how can you create you the value? Upgrade your resume, make your photo better, make your English speaking or learning or whatever, uh, cooking even better, or start to build some curriculum for yourself. How to build, generate values for your company. How from your position can take more task force or take more uh, jobs portfolio for your company and try to learn more things for yourself. By building, like for example, if you are not a PPT PowerPoint uh, person, you don't need because you can just use one minute to make a PPT, and you can just use one minute to make the prompt twelve pages for the PPT, and you just can create the website in like thirty minutes time. You can create a video, audio, storybook, like even a songs, lyrics, everything in just less than half an hour time. So just try to be more creative and never stop learning. So this is what we do, and try to implement AI in your life. This is really important, and, and this is what I'm doing. I'm not learning how to build AI. I'm just learning how to use AI. Okay, that's all from me. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I, for one, am very bullish on Indonesia. In the startup world, we talk about timing being the most important factor for a company to succeed. So if you look at the timing for Indonesia, from a demographic perspective, from an economic, social, political perspective, timing is really good. We have our own market, low, own consumptive 270 million people, which makes us unique from the other 200 countries of the world. There's a Sanskrit word, which is common to Indonesian, Bahasa Indonesia also. It is called sabar, patience. Little patience for the TikTok generation. We need to just temper down, have a little patience. For technology to succeed and for us to leapfrog, in five, 10 years, what took other countries 50, 60 years, I go back to my acronym of DIRT for AI, et cetera, to succeed. D for data. It needs large amount of data. And please don't give your data to companies that store it in a server in the desert in Texas or under the sea in some stupid country. Make them set up the data center here, which the Indonesian government has done and successfully. 
The same AWS set up a $5 billion data center in Indonesia. I for infrastructure, which is the network, the bandwidth, et cetera. R for regulation, what is allowed, what is not allowed. Now DIR is in the government's domain and we have to trust them to do the right thing for us. The T, talent, is what can fail all the other three. That is in our control. Let us coach the young people and influencers to allow young minds to pursue skill-based careers and transform this nation technologically. Thank you so much. Thank you. About your summary, it can be summary from your side. It can be summary of summaries. <laughs> we need the summary. Okay. Coming back to the topic of our discussions this afternoon, I would like to share the story of one mother of two, which I just spoke to not too long ago through live Instagram. So I, I normally do that. I invite micro entrepreneurs for them to share in my live Instagram. That's why I invited you guys to follow at Indra Uno Instagram and I will follow you back, okay? <laughs> now, the story goes like this. Three years ago, the family went bankrupt just right before the crisis or the pandemic. And then she's a type of housewife that does not go outside the, their house for the activities. So the husband worked, but the wife still sees that they are struggling economically because they were just bankrupt. So she started an online business selling clothes that were made by others. So she was a reseller. Now, she also trains people to be her reseller. So she created a network. And in three years, after joining our community, and we did a lot of training and mentoring for her. And by the way, she's only 29 years old. She were able to build her, she just finished building her fashion factory after three years bankrupt earlier. And she has about 2000 reseller right now, earning about seven or revenue a month is about 700 million rupiah. And she did it all from inside her house. So I'm very, very optimistic. Stories like this can be replicated and can inspire a lot of mothers who is helping the economy of the household. And it can be used through technology because she just did it from the house, through WhatsApp, Tokopedia, the Shopee. And she, what she did differently is that she trained and mentored every day, the reseller. And I think one key takeaway of that, even if you use technology, innovation, and transformation of technology, one thing that you have to do is to the, in Indonesian, the word is pendampingan or mentoring coaching. But mentoring doesn't capture the nuance of pendampingan. Pendampingan is not pembinaan, it's different. Pembinaan is that you are sort of like a father figure and then you help your children. But pendampingan is like a friend in a journey, sometimes holding your hand so that you don't go left or right or go into a, a ditch. But it's, they, they can be younger than you because they started earlier than you. 
not in terms of age, biological age, but in terms of in enterprise, they started earlier. In micro enterprise, they started earlier. So with that, I would like to ask everyone to keep in touch. All right? Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think it's a really nice uh, story you have. Yeah. Um, I just, uh, what, next time you see her, ask her what is her goal? What is your goal? Because I think the, the main things what drive us is what is actual our goal inside ourselves. You know, because this is what drive us to build a family. This was what drive us to build a startup and stuff like this. So I think we have to really look into our mental health and our mental being, you know, uh, here around the world. And uh, I think for us, uh, uh, as start ASEAN, we are very happy to, to be here in the ASEAN region. And ASEAN region will be the next region in the world which start developing and developing quite fast. So with those kind of events, with those uh, amazing uh, panelists, we really would like to bring as much as possible summarized, very concrete information to different sectors. Same for the each startups, for the public sector, for the entrepreneurs, for, for the, the um, uh, for the venture funds, for the academics, you know, for, and, and and also for the government bringing the information so so they didn't uh, lose the momentum they actually lose this momentum of this very unique time where they have so many countries so many uh, uh, businesses which already have successful stories and they just need to use them implement it and really as someone said keep the data keep the data safe <laughs> because because the world is very you know um diverse and uh, it can be also can be beautiful things you know and can be uh, uh, black and white but it's i think it's about this harmony so thank you so much that you came and thank you for uh, all audience thank you